Hello everybody and welcome to this introductory video. Today I will be talking about ethical hacking and I will also introduce you to the course itself. So first off, you might have noticed that the term ethical hacking is composed out of two words. You have ethical and you have hacking. Now hacking, uh, the definition of hacking is quite broad. I mean it encompasses a very wide range of activities. However, if you actually go to any of the online dictionaries pretty much and if you type in the term hacking, generally it will say that it has something to do with computers. I cannot say that that is not true, however that is only a small portion of the definition. Rather instead, the act of hacking is actually having any system and I mean any system, not just a computer system, not just a digital system. In fact, it doesn't. the system doesn't even need to contain any electronic parts. So literally any system, having it do something that you intended it to do as opposed to what it was designed to do. Now here is one short example uh, that has been cited over and over again. You have a lock, basically. You have a door lock in your house. Everybody has one. Well, I sincerely hope that you have one. And the purpose of that lock is to prevent anybody is to prevent intruders from entering. So anybody who does not have a key cannot enter. Uh, people, but people people enter without a key anyway because they pick the lock and then they enter, and that itself could be considered an act of hacking also an act of burglary, but that's, an, that's another subject. Anyway, the ethical side of it would be when you have these large automobile industry uh, manufacturers and then they hire people, they hire these burglars to come and pen test their locks. So basically they pay them very good sums of money to go to their factories and to try to unlock their cars. Uh, this doesn't need to apply only to locks for cars, it can also apply for your door locks. Manufacturers of pretty much all sorts of locks, they hire people to actually try and pick lock them and then if they succeed doing it, and if they succeed, they pay them a very good sum of money. I do believe that prices for one car manufacturer they went up to 1 million euros if you manage to break their locks. But what I'm trying to say here is that they have the ethical side of it would be when you have a permission to do it when it's within the constraints of the law and the act of hacking itself can be within the constraints of the law but doesn't necessarily need to be. Anyway, we will not be focusing on those types of locks today uh, or during this course. During this course I will teach you how to penetrate networks, how to exploit systems, how to break into computers, how to uh, compromise routers, etc. You will be, after, the, after you've finish this course after you've absorbed all the information in it you will gain the ability to do some serious damage. Now because of that I wish to give a disclaimer here. So first off I do not encourage any sort of illegal activity. Furthermore I strongly advise against it and I am against it. So you do not have any legit need to do anything that is against the law with the knowledge that you're going to get du during this course because you're going to get some pretty good knowledge and you can abuse it very easily. It's not that difficult to abuse it. The, the opportunities are everywhere. They're endless because people tend to use insecure systems or they use secure systems but they don't know how to operate or configure them and then in turn those secure systems become insecure. But what I'm trying to tell you is uh, there really is no need. I mean if you want to do it for the money or something like that you can make the same amount if not more in a perfectly legitimate way. Uh, people will pay you to actually test their networks and to see if you can find any vulnerabilities in them and then report them, perhaps even fix them. 
so however if you do decide to do something uh, against the law in any country uh, I am not responsible for it first of that is what I want to say I do not claim responsibility for it as I have already stated that I am doing this for purely for educational purposes and I do not advocate the use of this material for any sort of illegal purpose now I hope you understand why I had to make this disclaimer and I this is not what I said these are not just empty words I really do stand by it and that is my philosophy as well in any case uh, during the during this course I will show you numerous examples methods you will need some prerequisites over which I will go in the next tutorial but you're in for a ride so sit down be patient that is a very important thing in this line of work patience because everybody has I mean everybody out there I mean if you are looking at this tutorial now if you've typed in the term ethical hacking I'm guessing that you've seen some I'm guessing at some point of time in your lives like myself you have seen a movie that involves some sort of hacking with computers and you see this terminal and you just see them typing in something there and it just break and it just basically works it works within five minutes or something like that let me tell you something that is not that has nothing to do with the real world or very little to do with the real world in the real world people spend countless sleepless nights trying to trying to do something trying to obtain access trying to bypass a pa password protected file or something of a kind in a server trying to escalate privileges trying to inject in a SQL injection or something of a kind and they not only spend countless sleepless nights doing it but they also spend a long time planning preparing and getting a general idea of what they can do how they can execute an attack etc these are not things that you will be able to do in fi within five minutes after you sit and open up your computer your desktop computer or whatever uh, you will need time you will need patience but above all you will need to be curious uh, curiosity is one of the first steps here and obvious obviously since you've actually chosen to listen to this tutorial to go through it you do possess it already you just need to build on it a little bit more and you'll be where you want to be in any case I hope to see you in the next tutorial and I bid you farewell hello everybody and welcome to this tutorial today I will be talking about some of the prerequisites that you will require if you if you want to follow this course through one of the first things that you need to be familiarized with is your working environment so for myself I have chosen to use two Linux distros one will be Fedora 20 which is my which is the operating system that I am using anyway and also I will install a virtual machine that virtual machine will be Kali Linux basically it is a Linux distro which contains a great deal of pen testing tools so it's very useful in that sense uh, don't worry about it I will explain this process in great detail how you can set the virtual machine up how you can install it and so on and so forth however should you be using Windows uh, that is definitely not advisable for this kind of activity primarily because uh, you will I mean since I'm doing this in a environment that I own uh, it doesn't really matter to me if I'm anonymous or not but uh, in the real world all the pen testing that is done in the real world you're always trying to anonymize yourself you're trying to be as invisible as possible as in, as much as possible you do not want them to figure out where the attack is coming from or anything of a kind you want to wipe your tra you want to wipe your trail or something of a kind and Windows is really not good for those sort of things so there your anonymity level will be very low and uh, most of the tools that we're going to be using they are native to the Linux environment they were made for Linux 
so some of them might not work under Windows. I have not tested them all out, but some, of, but most of them will. So you can still use Windows if you like, because I mean you're not hiding from any but anyone. But since I'm recreating the real life scenario here, I do need to actually use proxies, VPNs, and so on and so forth, just to show you how it is done, how you can do it. Also, for all the Mac users out there, if you're using Mac OS X, it doesn't really matter which, which version, uh, most of the stuff should work like no problems. Uh, the procedures are fairly simpler. The command line tools are the same, how you install them differs, but pretty much you will be able to run the same commands uh, as me. So there shouldn't be any problems there. Uh, your anonymity level with Mac OS with Mac OS X should be relatively good, but still on Linux you have the greatest uh, the greatest anonymity and you are rather safe in that sense. Other than that, you will also require uh, you will also require working internet connection. And even though all of these attacks that we're gonna do today, well, most of them, they work much, much better if you have an extremely fast internet connection. But some of these attacks are actually conducted from public Wi-Fi's, in real life anyway. Uh, we'll just pretend I will set up a wireless access point in my house and load it so that it's similar to the public Wi-Fi, which is very slow. Uh, some of these attacks, as I said, they go over public Wi-Fi's and as we all know and as we've all painfully learned, public Wi-Fi's are not the fastest internet connections out there. So primarily because you have a lot of people that are connected to them and there's a lot of data going through, they're not the safest network site out there either. But as I said, if you want to absolutely anonymize yourself, and that is what some people do, they actually go out and hook up to a public Wi-Fi or they go to a bar or something of a kind and conduct their attacks from there. Now, before they do that, they need to figure out whether the bandwidth of that Wi-Fi can sustain their attack. So they need to minimize it, they need to downsize it, and that is how they become absolutely anonymous. Anyway, the third thing that you will absolutely need, so the, these three things, these are the basic requirements. There are everything else we'll pick up on the way. I will show you how to do it, no problems there. But these three things, uh, I can't really show you how to, I mean, I can, but it's a bit pointless how to go to your ISP and hook it, hook it up to the internet and hook your uh, telephone to the internet or something of a kind. But in any case, the third prerequisite is a working wireless card. And when I say working wireless card, uh, most of the devices have them. Pretty much all laptops from 2005 or from 2008 were standardized with wireless cards. If you're using a desktop machine that doesn't have a wireless card, you can, uh, you should, but it's not, you don't need to. But however, if you want, you won't be able to follow through a portion of this tutorial then. Uh, you should go out and buy a USB uh, wireless card or something of a kind. They're pretty cheap, I don't know, 10, 15 bucks. So they're not that expensive and you can get them pretty much anywhere. Anyway, as I was saying, what I mean by a functional wireless network card is that it is recognized by your operating system. So if you are using a Linux distro like I am, you need to make sure that this Linux distro, that the kernel of this Linux distro actually has the necessary drivers for the wireless card that you are using at the moment. Uh, if you're, you're probably using Atheros or Broadcom, Atheros should be fine. Pretty much Linux kernel support a large amount of Atheros devices, if not all of them, in terms of network cards, so that should be fine. There were some problems with Broadcom, but that's as, as far as I'm informed, that has been solved, so no big deal there. If you're uncertain how to, ch how to check whether you whether your wireless card functions under your Linux distro, well, just try connecting to a Wi-Fi. If you can connect to a Wi-Fi access point, if you can connect, obviously it works. If you can't, it doesn't work. 
but don't don't just hop to a conclusion that it doesn't work maybe maybe it's just turned off or something like that but do not worry I will show this uh, in greater detail in the follow-up tutorials where we actually go over the installation process and all of that now there are a couple more things which we need to go over before we head over and start the installation uh, I would just like to go over some basic terms in over some basic terminology that you will need in order to be able to follow this course in order for you to be able to follow the future tutorials. In any case, I bid you farewell and I thank you for watching. Hello everybody and welcome to this tutorial. Today I will be talking about some of the basic terms which you will need in order to follow this course through. So first off, you have three main categories of people. There are white hat hackers, gray hat hackers, and black hat hackers. Uh, everything that we will be doing falls into this category here, so white hats. Uh, those are people whose activities are within the confines of the law. There are people such as pen testers, ethical hackers, people like you and me, and so on. Then you have gray hat hackers whose activities are bordering between legal and illegal. It's a bit of a shady area there. In addition to that, you have the most known category, which is black hat hackers. And usually, and unfortunately, every time somebody hears the term hacking, uh, it is associated with people from black hat world. There are people who conduct all sorts of illegal activities or conduct activities without any regard for the law and, I don't know, extract information from certain servers, credentials, your credit card information, take services down, usually to extract some sort of financial gain. In any case, down below, you have footprinting. Now, the act of footprinting is basically information gathering. Uh, you are you are conducting some sort of reconnaissance work. You are figuring out the IP of the server, uh, figuring out which ports are open, and with that you can conclude which services are running there. But it doesn't necessarily need to be confined to the digital world. The act of footprinting can also be when you go to the company itself, you just walk in, doesn't necessarily need to be a company, it can be pretty much any building with the servers in it, and you, tr you have a look around, you try to gather some information there on site, or you go and you dig to their trash cans, go behind the building, jump into those uh, trash containers, and get some information from there. Also, people have been known to go onto parking lots to see who the employees are, who works there, all sorts of things. So this is just general information gathering in regards to your chosen target. It doesn't need to be confined to the digital world. Anyway, down below you have certain types of attacks. You have DOS and DDoS. Very sim basically the same thing implemented in a different way. DOS stands for denial of service usually called childish attacks because they were relatively easy to implement and they still are provided of course you have enough machines but that's that's the domain of DDoS. In general what happens here is that you perform a certain amount of requests more requests than a server can handle and then server begins dropping connections. For example Apache web server I believe by default it can handle up to 10,000 connections or so. And if you can make more than 10,000 requests, basically everybody else making any sort of requests will not be able to access the website because their connections will be dropped simply because Apache will say, okay, I have too many users, I have more users than I can handle, all the other connections will be dropped by default. Thereby making the site inaccessible, even though you haven't really you haven't really broken any codes, you haven't really broken any broken through any firewalls or stolen any passwords or anything of a kind. But when you're dosing something, it's just you. So all the connection, all the requests, everything is coming just from your own computer, and that is not always the most efficient of ways. In fact it generally can only work if there is a 
flaw in the way in which requests are processed. However, that is why you have DDoS attacks. When you have multiple computers, multiple connections, and they are all making simultaneous requests to a certain server, and this is really difficult to fight off. I mean, you really need to have a clever configuration of your firewall and you need to have quite a good firewall as well. Usually you would need a physical one to prevent these sort of DDoS attacks and by physical I mean a router firewall or something of a kind. Uh, this is quite difficult to, it's not difficult to actually uh, do the attack itself as it is difficult to make the necessary preparations. First of all, you need to go about infecting other devices which you will use, which you will enslave and use in order to perform this sort of an, an attack. This is the hard part. The DDoS part is quite easy compared to that. For that, in order for you to infect other computers, you need two things. You need rats, remote administration tools, and you need to make and you need to make them you need to make them fully undetectable. That is what the term FUD stands for. So it just means that they cannot be detected by antiviruses or they are, or more precise term would be that they are not labeled as something malicious by antivirus programs. And by the way, uh, sometimes, actually most of the time, most of the times you don't actually need to make your own applications fully undetectable. There are plenty of pen testing companies out there and not just pen testing companies, but other companies as well who will pay very good sums of money if you can make their programs fully undetectable by antivirus programs. Down below, the RATS remote administration tools. Now, they themselves are not some sort of hacks or anything of a kind. They're just, they, you just basically put them on a USB stick or something of a kind, uh, send them in a mail, send them, in, uh, share them in a zip file, and in such a way, that's just one of the ways to infect other computers, other devices, enslave them, convert them into, into your slaves, into the slaves of the main server, wherever that might be, wherever you might set it up. And then you can use all of those computers to conduct all sorts of activity. This is, this is very good because it anonymizes you to a very large extent. It is very difficult to track you. It is very difficult to track somebody down, whoever is doing this, primarily because the users who are infected, they have no idea that somebody else is controlling their devices because nothing is really happening on your desktop. You can't really see. All the processes running are being run in the background and your processor is executing them using up the only way to see it would be basically to start up a task manager or something of a kind and then see the running processes and perhaps you could spot it there but not even there if somebody has implemented a rootkit so a rootkit is a tool basically which you install onto an operating system and it is able to hide running processes from the system itself. So when you, for example, start a task manager in Windows or something of a kind, the purpose of a rootkit would be to hide the processes from the task manager. Basically how it works is that task manager requests information from the system, from the kernel, and then the kernel of the system responds, which is the core of the system where all the drivers and the key functionalities are. Uh, the kernel of the system then responds, hey, I have this, 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 and this process running, here you go. But what rootkit would do is redirect those requests from task manager to itself and would basically say, I don't have such processes running. So very, very dangerous and potent combinations here that we will use later on as we progress through this tutorial. But for the time being, I just wanted to give a bit of an introduction to it and give you an idea of what we shall be doing through some of these basic terms and concepts. Next up, we have phishing attacks. Now, phishing attacks are basically when you apply some sort of bait, somebody bites it, and then you pull on it. Simple as that, right? As the same way you do phishing. Well, not quite. Uh, phishing attacks would be when you get a, 
I don't know, an email from someone and there's a link in there's a link in it you click on it and it throws you somewhere I don't know onto some website it perhaps looks like something legit it perhaps looks like a website that you are using or something of a kind but it is not and you pass in your credentials and that can be a problem but this is generally avoided today this is not something that happens in such a way rather instead what happens these days is that the DNS servers get changed on your routers and once that happens all the requests that you make on your web browser get redirected so for example if you type in facebook.com you're gonna get a domain with facebook.com from some private DNS server God knows where whose MX records are altered and they have been configured for example to make redirections to interpret sorry not redirections but rather instead to interpret facebook.com to a certain IP address that does not belong to Facebook or anything like that so you open up your Facebook it looks exactly the same there is no way to tell because in the in the upper left corner of the screen you have the domain name written it's www.facebook.com and basically providing login credentials once you do that they're gone somebody has them one of the one of the ways uh, to detect this, even though it's very, I mean, it's not hard, but nobody really pays any attention to it. Uh, in the upper left corner, you might check whether the protocol is HTTPS instead of HTTP. Because usually, if these kind of attacks are conducted, it's not going to be HTTPS, as that is a lot harder to implement. But if it is HTTPS, there really wouldn't be any legit way of figuring it out other than actually checking the keys, checking the certificates, and nobody actually does that. I mean, well, maybe not nobody, but 99% of users out there are not going to bother to go about conducting such checks. Anyway, I know it sounds a bit complex, but believe me, I will explain this in great details. I will give you several demonstrations and by the end of this course you will understand and know how to do this with great ease. It will not present a significant obstacle in your line of work. Excellent. Now that we have approximately half of these terms out of our way, I will continue to deal with them in the follow-up tutorial, and I sincerely hope to see you all there. Hello everybody, and welcome to this tutorial. Here I'm just going to continue from where I left off in the previous one. If you have not seen the previous tutorial, I strongly urge you to do so as the two are uh, closely interrelated, so to say. Anyway, uh, previously we've discussed some of these things such as DOS, RATS, phishing, and so on and so forth. But here I want to go... Uh, I want to go a step further and tell you about SQL injections. VPNs, proxies, stores, EPS key loggers, and so on and so forth. You will see how all these things will play a role later on throughout the course. But for the time being, you have SQL injections, which are which simply passing SQL queries to HTTP requests. If they are not properly formatted by the PHP code on the server side, this can present a serious problem. And this is always a, one of the primary consideration of all the web developers out there. Later on, I will demonstrate how you can use these, formulate them, and there is a large amount of websites uh, that are vulnerable out there, primarily because the frameworks on which they are based are vulnerable as well. Next up, you have virtual private networks, so VPNs. Uh, these are ways of anonymizing yourselves. Basically, if you have an IP, if you have an, a VPN provider somewhere, and if you want to anonymize yourself, you will route all their traffic through this VPN provider, and all the traffic between you and the VPN provider will be heavily encrypted. So any other server out there that is receiving requests from you, it is actually receiving them from VPN. Uh, there is no real way of detecting you or of finding your physical location unless the VPN provider actually gives it up, which doesn't really happen if you pick a right one. Down below you have proxies. Uh, now proxies are a less reliable way of staying anonymous, but you should always make it your 
uh, make it your common practice to use SOX5 proxies. I will explain what these are. I will introduce them when we do proxy chains and when I explain to you how you can actually stay anonymous while conducting these sort of activities. You will realize that you can route your connection through several proxies, but very soon you will see as well that that doesn't always work. I mean, in the movies or something like that, you see people going through 10, 20 different proxies. In reality, that would be very, very difficult to implement, primarily because of internet speeds, because of the available bandwidth. Uh, most of the free proxies out there are not very fast, and routing your connection through several of them will, will make it very difficult for you to do anything in a reasonable amount of time. There are, of course, paid proxies, but when you pay a proxy, you leave a digital footprint somewhere, so you can be traced. Down below, you have Tor. Now, Tor is absolutely free, open source, and it is much faster than proxies. It's not faster than VPNs, but it is faster than proxies. Uh, it gives you an ability to Torify your applications, which in essence means simply routing traffic through certain... Uh, through certain routes and using certain routers on the internet to actually, not just routers, but using certain devices on the internet for your packets, for your connection to go through. Uh, it can be slow from time to time. It is not a 100% guarantee, but you will be anonymous to a very large extent if you are using Tor. There are ways of detecting you, but they are highly unlikely to happen. Like 99.99% 99 .99 of time, you will be almost 100% anonymous, which is a very good way of functioning. Also, you have the Tor browser, which allows you to access dark web or the hidden web, however you wish to call it. Basically, uh, those are dot .onion websites, and they are not indexed by any of the search engines out there, and they cannot be accessed by a regular uh, internet browser from the regular internet browsing perspective. You cannot, I mean, if you open up Firefox and if you have your internet connection, and if you don't have your internet connection configured in a proper way to connect to a network or something of a kind, you will not be able to con access any of the hidden webs or dark webs, website services, and so on and so forth. I will also show you how to access dark web and how to use it as it has a vast amount of resources that are at your disposal, uh, most of them free, some of them paid, and so on and so forth. Down below you have VPS, these are virtual private servers. It is a method of, it is a secure, it can be viewed as a security layer. For example, if you have an Apache server running on your physical machine, you can have a virtual machine within that physical machine which will serve as an SQL server for that Apache server. This is done so that the SQL server cannot be accessed from outside and that you don't have an SQL port open on your physical machine. So only devices, only programs and users from that particular machine will be able to access the virtual machine where the SQL server is. A uh, bit of back and forth action here. It might sound unclear or something like that, but I don't want you to worry about it now. Uh, when I show you the examples, when you get into it, you will you will understand it. I guarantee it to you. So no problems there. Here I'm just introducing you to the terminology and giving you an idea of what is to come. Excellent. So we have we also have key loggers, which are which are tools that are used to steal credentials, and so not only credentials, but also used to extract information. If you, if you manage to deploy a keylogger on a machine, you can configure it to send, to record all keystrokes and then to send them to a mail address, to an FTP server. Uh, today, keyloggers are advanced to the extent that they have, uh, they have like a hundred options or so configurable to the fullest of extents and you can do pretty much whatever you want with them. I mean, they do. They they have their basic functionalities still. Basic functionalities is still there to record the keystrokes. But not only do they record the keystrokes, for example, they can extract existing information as well. You can configure their behavior. 
uh, how how the stealth level of the keylogger, how will it hide, where will it go, where will it be installed, what sort of information do you want to be, do you want to extract, do you want to monitor particular folders for activity, and do you want to record it, you can configure them to take screenshots, you can configure them to use the camera on the device which you ha on which you have deployed a keylogger to take us to take a picture every five minutes or something like that, that would be that wouldn't be a, the brightest of ideas because obviously somebody would see that you're taking a picture. But that, those are just those are just examples of what you can do with them. And later on, we will actually download the genuine key logger, install it, deploy it. We'll show you methods of deployment and how you can configure it as well. Although you should be very careful from where you download your tools, such as key loggers. Uh, remote administration tools, rootkits, and so on and so forth, primarily because you never, ever want to download a uncompiled binary file that is not open source because you have no way of knowing what's in it and you absolutely never want to run it on your computer. Uh, you might get what you want, you know, a keylogger or something of a kind, but your computer might get infected with exactly the same keylogger that you plan to deploy somewhere or with exactly the same rat that you intend to deploy somewhere. So that's not the, that's not a very bright idea. Uh, you should use verified sources of such tools. I will show a few to, I will show a few of them later on as I go over the, as I go over to the internet and download them. But I'm just making it very clear here that you should be very careful with these things. And one of the foolproof methods of doing this is actually configuring a virtual machine and doing this sort of activity on that virtual machine. So even if you get infected or something of a kind, it doesn't matter. It's a virtual machine. You, you can reinstall it anytime you want very fast. Pretty much no information will be lost there. More importantly, the primary file system on your main physical machine will not be accessed from the virtual machine. D anyway, down below you have the terminal. So terminal is basically an interface uh, for you that allows you to control your operating system. Now Linux terminal is very powerful. We will be using it extensively. You will need to familiarize yourselves with it. I will familiarize you with it. I will teach you how to use it. Uh, to some people it might seem a bit a uh, bit difficult or a bit tricky at first sight you know there's a lot of, there there are a lot of commands to type in uh, how to memorize them all where, where what to use where and so on and so forth but believe me there is a certain logic to it and once you figure it out everything just flies i know about i know by heart about 30% of possible commands out there regarding linux terminals and the rest I simply figure out with dash H or dash dash help. The system pretty much tells you everything you need to know. It helps you out to a great extent and you are able to figure out a lot of things from just from just understanding the basic logic, how it works and so on. Now there are some there will there will always of course be arguments and then there'll be people saying, well, why? Why would you use terminals? Why wouldn't you just use GUI tools or something like that? Uh, the simple answer is because they are not as nearly as powerful as the terminal tools are. Plus, terminal tools have far less dependencies, and most of the hacking tools are basically designed for the terminals. They're not, they don't have GUIs. A lot of them do have them these days, but mm, I might go over them briefly at a certain point of time because it is not the GUI interfaces are not that relevant when you figure it out how to do it on the terminal you will automatically by default know how to do it with the graphical user interface for that particular program anyway uh, down below you have firewalls now firewall in Linux is configured through IP table commands you keep on passing arguments and configuring these firewalls and this is one of the main reasons why we why you should not be using any distribution of windows for this particular tutorial to follow this tutorial you do you will need to install a as i said previously you will need to install 
uh, either a Linux virtual machine or create a dual boot or something of a kind. Uh, I will, I will of course show how to do this and demonstrate it in great detail. But one of the main reasons, the firewalls are one of the main reasons why we can't use Windows for these sort of purposes. Uh, Linux firewall is open source and it has ridiculous amount of options. A ridiculous amount. I'm not kidding here. You can do with it pretty much whatever you want. You can uh, configure, you can close open ports, forward connections uh, via ports or via IP addresses. Uh, you can close, you can just forbid certain protocols on certain ports or forbid certain protocols for certain IP addresses, do all manner of forwarding and redirection and so on and so forth. This is all available for free with a Linux firewall. Whilst in Windows you won't, you will have some of these options, but most of them you won't unless you, for example, buy a certain package or something like that, which is not something that we really want to do here. We want to keep it. We want to keep this budget friendly, and we want to have a powerful firewall which can do pretty much whatever we want it to do. Now there there'll be two ways of configuring this firewall, and if you are afraid of messing it up, don't worry about it, because most of the configurations that we will do will be short uh, short lived configurations, so to say, primarily because all the configurations made to the firewall from IP tables command, unless specified otherwise, will be temporary and they will hold until the next system reset. There is a way to circumvent this, of course, and to configure the uh, the firewall rules in the configuration file directly and thereby making the changes permanent, uh, which is also one of the ways of doing it, but I don't generally prefer it. I prefer to have a script somewhere which you can run at any time and it will configure a firewall by default. This is primarily because you not this is primarily because you won't have it you won't have your tool set and a USB stick or somewhere online or something of a kind and you have these quick scripts which you generate and then they perform these tasks for you in an automated fashion it's really simple I will show you how to make these scripts you don't need you do not necessarily need some advanced programming knowledge or anything of a kind basically what these scripts are are a list of term Linux terminal commands which we will do anyway so you basically the, sc the script would consist out of a list of those commands and then you just change the mod of the of the script to be ex to be an executable file, run it, and all those commands uh, are you are passed to the system, and those tasks are finished in an automated fashion by default. Anyway, one of the final things that I wish to address here are reverse shells. So there are hundreds, if not thousands, of reverse shells out there that you can use. I will pick a few that we will use depending on the framework, uh, depending on the environment of course that we want to infect. But in essence what reverse shells are, uh, as the name itself says, you have a program which, with which you infect another device and then that program opens up a reverse connection from that device back to you. So you can keep on passing uh, commands, you can keep on controlling the system even though you are nowhere near it. There are different types of course today with routers and so on and so forth with such firewalls you do need to do a lot of extra configuration and there are problems that need to be solved and addressed. You will see how when you are trying to break into a single computer sometimes you need to break into the router first, usually you need to break into the router first unless you're performing these phishing sort of attacks or there's a web server or something of a kind running in the background but attacking a private device a private computer which is usually what people do as preludes to bigger hacks because they want to extract some sort of information or something of a kind from let's say a company's employee that's a network administrator or somebody like that they will one of the basic vectors would be to attack a home router, change the DNS settings there, and try to steal the credentials in such a way, or put the computer in the DMZ of the router, the militarized zone, so that the router, so that the router is no longer effective for that device, 
rather instead it just forwards all traffic to that device regardless so that can be those are just some of the some of the types of attacks that you can do but reverse shells will depend on the choice of your of the of the environment that you are uh, trying to infect and will depend on the choice of your attack route as well. In any case, I hope that you got some basic introduction to these terms. Uh, I, I again repeat, if you didn't figure it out all immediately, don't worry about it. We will do all of this in great details with a lot of examples and you will understand that it's not complicated. Uh, do not allow fear to dissuade or stop you just keep on going in spite of it and if you can just stick in uh, till the end of this course you will I guarantee it to you you will understand it with just a bit of focus and a bit of curiosity you will be able to obtain the necessary skills needed in order to become a pen tester or an ethical hacker I bid you all farewell and I hope to see you in the next tutorial thank you for enrolling in this course you are going to love this course because this is a course of action. Everything you see in this course is hands-on inside the interface and what you can do is follow along. Try these things on your own. I find I learn best by doing. So this is intended for every single lecture. You can watch the lecture. You can have another monitor open and try it at the same time. You can try it after the lecture, or you can do that repeatedly. Try it, go back to the lecture, try it, go back to the lecture. You will learn exceptionally useful skills in this course if you test out these things as we show you how to do them. You will also get right at the beginning of this course in a PDF a list of websites you can use to get paid to learn and apply these skills. What you can do is sign up as a freelancer, put your profile up there, and start adding these skills to what you know. There are companies all over the world that need help with the skills taught in this course, and they will pay you to try what you're learning in this course as a freelancer. And then you get better at it as you get paid to do it more. That's exactly how I learned and grew my business, by continually getting paid to learn skills people needed help with. That's what you get in this course. You get a hands-on learning experience in every lecture where you can go try these things. And this course starts off showing you exactly how to get everything set up. What you need prior to starting this course is a good internet connection, although you can do it on a slower public Wi-Fi internet connection. This course will work best if you follow the first several sections showing you exactly how to install all of the software for an ideal experience. Once you've got that set up, Erm and I are continuing to add tons of new lectures. This course will eventually have 10 plus hours of video showing you exactly everything you can do once this is set up. So get started by looking at all of the setup instructions and doing them yourself. Get to know the basic terms and then you can have an awesome experience out of this course. Ermin and I are here to listen to your feedback. At any time, all you have to do is tell us exactly what you think of a lecture, ask us a question, and Ermin and I are here to answer your questions every single day. We commit to answering any discussion question you ask as fast as we can, which usually will be 48 to 72 hours, sometimes shorter, sometimes longer. So go ahead, get the most out of this course, and we are honored you are here spending this time with us. Thank you. Hello everybody, and welcome to this tutorial. Today I will be talking about our working environment. I will show you how you can set it up. So first off, we need to install VirtualBox. Now, it doesn't matter if you're running Mac OS X, Linux, or Windows, you will still need to do this uh, for several reasons, really. First, off, first of all, I mean, we're going to be doing a lot of stuff, and we're going to be doing it as root. So we are, we are always facing the prospect that we might break something, that we might mess something up. 
and it's just better to have that virtual machine because even if you do mess something up and even if you don't know how to fix it it doesn't really matter it is only a virtual machine there is you don't really have any data of importance on it however if you mess something up on your main machine that can be problematic you if if you're forced to reinstall it or something of a kind then you need to back all your data up you need to figure out where everything is etc but or you can try fixing the problem and depending on what that is it could consume a large amount of your time so just take my advice for it and go ahead and install VirtualBox it's not that complicated it's pretty simple I'll show you how to do it in a minute there is another reason why we're installing a virtual machine and that is safety we're gonna be downloading a lot of stuff from the net and even though I will be using sites that I consider to be safe and that a lot of other people consider to be safe it is always good to have that extra layer of protection so even if something happens on your virtual machine even if it gets compromised or something of a kind it's fine it's a virtual machine no problems there there's nothing of importance there your private information is not there your credit card is not there uh, there is literally nothing there aside from the tools that you are using that can be obtained from the internet anyway so without further ado uh, let's just go ahead and see how VirtualBox is installed now there are two ways of doing this one is preferable over the other so the first method is a lot simpler so you can just go ahead open up your favorite browser mine is Firefox use your favorite search engine type in virt virtual box virtual box press enter and there you go straight off the bat you have official site virtual box just gonna go ahead and open it in the left corner it says about screenshots there's a ton load of documentation here uh, for the time being there really isn't any need to go over it rather instead just click downloads excellent so here you have a list of host machines you have VirtualBox for Windows host for OS X host for Linux host Solaris Solaris hosts actually for Solaris you can just use it from the repositories immediately but for the time being uh, we cannot use the repositories we need to configure them in Linux and repositories in Linux are places from where you pull your software for your Linux distro anyway we will need VirtualBox for Linux hosts I have already downloaded it in order to save time in this tutorial but you just click on it and then it pops so you have this is these guys are amazing they have this virtual machine manager set up for multiple Linux distributions so you have Ubuntu you have Debian not sure why they actually separated Ubuntu and Debian but it doesn't really matter since Ubuntu is based on Debian pretty much everything that works in Debian will work on Ubuntu as well you have OpenSUSE uh, while we even have the enterprise but for the time being I'm interested in Fedora and even though Fedora 21 came out and it says here Fedora 18 that's perfectly fine uh, it's gonna run no problems anyway right next to it you have i386 and AMD 64 what these markations mean well basically they're just references to 32-bit and 64-bit architectures if you do not know what your machine is whether it's 32-bit or 64-bit well no problems there just go ahead and open up your terminal type in u name space dash a press enter you don't need to be root to do this you can do this as pretty much any user and you have you get a you get a listing of information here so you have Linux platform local host that's the domain you have the version of the kernel and Fedora distribution as well it's number 20 and then you have the architecture so it's x86 underline 64 there we go 64 bit architecture fantastic now that we have established that we can you can actually go ahead and click on it 
if you're using a 32-bit one, just click on the 32-bit one. The procedure is absolutely the same. There are literally no differences. It gives me an option to save a file, so just click Save and then click OK. That will download the file for, for, for you in the default downloads folder, unless you've configured it in a different fashion. I'm just going to go ahead and cancel it because, as I said, I've downloaded it previously in order to save some time in this tutorial. So just cancel. Go back to your terminal. Now clear the screen. You will need to be root in order to do this. So just type in su, press enter, and type in your password. And of course, I got my password wrong. I'm, I'm quite famous for doing this. I don't know why, but it's fine when I forget my passwords. When I forget my encryption keys, that can be a bit of a problem. Anyway, there is a tool for managing RPM packets. As this is a Red Hat distro, all the packets, software packets for it, have an extension .rpm. Here, let me just go ahead and show this to you. I'm going to go ahead and create a bit of a bigger zoom in so you can all see what I am doing here. Now, I am currently using the terminal and I will give more detailed explanations. Uh, I will instruct you on in how to use it. I will explain pretty much all the commands that we will be using in great detail, but for the time being, just tune in and follow through. So there's a command ls, and then I want to go to the folder downloads. Home. Uh, chronic, that's me, that's uh, the username, downloads, and oops, VirtualBox, there we go. Press enter, I'm just going to go ahead and clear the screen one more time, there we go. Got exactly the same thing, but a bit better looking. Anyway, you see this extension that I have marked, it says .rpm. Now .rpm represents a type of packet that I have stated previously that is meant specifically for certain Linux distributions uh, such as Red Hat, Fedora, CentOS, and a few others. What you can do is use your default RPM software. So just type in RPM space dash I, dash I argument is for install, and then specify the path to your packet, to your package, so home, chronic, downloads, uh, virtual box, and press enter from here. Now again, uh, this this process is automated. There isn't much that you need to do here. Maybe press yes and that's it along the way. But in any case, this is not the method that you should be using. This is the method that I'm showing that you can use, but I wouldn't advise as if you do install it like this, it tends to break with newer updates, so it can be a bit problematic. I'll show you another method in the next tutorial where you can actually use yum, which is the default packet manager, in order to install this packet and then update it accordingly. In any case, I bid you farewell, and I'll see you in the next tutorial where I'll pick this up. Hello everybody and welcome to this tutorial. Today I will show you another more reliable way to install VirtualBox. If you are wondering why, why on earth did I show you the other way using the RPM, uh, if we're not going to use it here, well, it's always good to have another option. Plus, the procedure is exactly the same if you're installing any other RPM package. So you just type in RPM-I and then you just type in the name of the package that you have downloaded and that you wish to install. The procedure is exactly the same. I would recommend passing an H argument as well to give you a status bar because if you just go ahead and type it in like this with the name of the package, uh, it's going to install it no problems of course, but it's, the screen is just going to wait. Nothing is going to happen. You might think it's bugged or something like that during the installation procedure. Like this with H, there's a status bar that shows, so you know that something in the background is happening. But as I said, it's good to have another option. What we want to do today and now is actually install VirtualBox using the default packet manager called yum and pull the package from the repositories. Now, what are repositories? Repositories are places where software packages are stored and for Linux distros, and then you can pull those packets, those software packets, 
from your Linux distro using the default packet manager. It's very simple, it's extremely easy, and it's one of those things that you will absolutely need to know how to do because you'll be installing and uninstalling a lot of things during the course of your pen testing career, during the course of pretty much any pen testing exercise in general. So let me just demonstrate this to you. You type in yum and then you give it a command. First of all, you use yum to call your default packet manager, which is yum basically because I'm using Fedora, but if I was using some sort of a Debian distro, it could be aptitude, aptitude or it could be apt-get, and some other distros have their own packet managers, but we're not going to get into those now. Later on, I will show you what Kali Linux is using. That is the Linux distro that we will be using in order to conduct some of the pen testing exercises. So first off, you type in yum, as I said, and then type in search, which is a you're basically telling yum what to do. You want it to search for something. So you just type in search. It's ex pretty much exactly the same as English language. Just You just kind of need to figure out the logic of it. And then you want to search for an approximate name of the package that you want. So you don't, perhaps you don't know the full name or something like that. Uh, don't worry about it. Just type in a portion of the name. It will suffice and pretty much everything that contains that portion of the name will be displayed. So we know what we want, it's virtual box, and you might think that this is the full name of the package, but no, it is not, soon you will see. And there you go. It has printed out every packet, every package that contains virtual box in its name, the word virtual box in the name of the package or in the description of the package, because you see you have package the name of the package here, colon, and then you have the description of the package here. There are a lot of things, a lot of things have popped with the name VirtualBox, and you're wondering perhaps which one to install. Well, you need the Kmod one, and here you have the kernel version and the Fedora version. So FC would be the Fedora version, and here you have the, arch here you have the architecture, it's 64. I can't select it, there we go, it's 64, and here you have the kernel version, so you can compare it to what you have, and based on what you have, what your operating system is, you can pick it from here, assuming that it's a Fedora 20. You can use any other distro, the procedure is fairly the same. Later on in the question parts, if you're using, for example, a Debian-based distro, or a SUSE, open SUSE or something like that, feel free to ask me. If you can't manage it there, I will help you I will help you out, no problems. But for the time being, I'm just gonna go ahead and install it here. Let me just go ahead and clear the screen. In order to install the package, you need to type yum install, and then you need to go ahead and type the name of your package, which would be the last one for us, for me anyway. This one, oops, here we go. The name is a bit long, so I'm just going to go ahead and copy it. But you see, there is one fundamental problem here. Uh, the VirtualBox package, package is not found in the default repositories of Fedora. And that is a bit of a problem, primarily because none of these commands would actually work if I did not previously import RPM Fusion repositories. RPM Fusion is simply the name for a certain type of repositories containing certain types of packets. So I have imported those repositories and now I can pull information and packages from them. If I did not do that previously, I would not have been able to do any of these things. Uh, yum search virtual box would yield no results of whatsoever. I would get a blank screen, I would get like a message here saying that no packages were found that matched this particular name and then just a blank screen. That's it. So that can be problematic. In order to solve that problem you need to go ahead and open up your favorite browser. I already have this website open. To save a bit of time it says rpmfusion.org uh, slash configuration, but here let me just go ahead and search for it. So 
type into any search engine RPM Fusion, it's gonna pop, do not worry. So it's rpmfusion.org. Click on the website, open it up, and here you're gonna get instructions immediately. It's a very simple, simplistic website. Uh, there isn't any tinkering that you need to think about or some advanced configuration, nothing of a kind. It just says for users and says enable RPM Fusion on your system. Click OK. Uh, not OK, just click on the link and there you go. You get a listing here, you get a listing of downloads. Uh, it says free and non-free. And don't be intimidated with this non-free. You do not need to pay for anything. Uh, it is fr uh, non-free for redistributable software that is not open source software as defined by Fedora licensing guidelines. So this non-free does not refer to money. You do not need to pay anything here. <laughs> I cannot make that any clearer. It simply refers that the software is not open source software as defined by Fedora licensing guidelines. So uh, it might actually be open source, but it just doesn't fit within the boundaries of Fedora licensing guidelines. Anyway, that part is not that interesting to you. Down below, uh, the thing that you need to know here is that non-free is actually free in terms of money, but non-free in terms of source code. Anyway, uh, as I said, that's not really that important for you anyway at the moment. Down here, you have actually RPM packages. Remember from the previous tutorial, I've showed you the extension .rpm. When you download a package, we could actually uh, download one of these. Actually, I would download the first one and then install it using my, using my RPM software just type in rpm space dash i and then I would there we go I just clicked on it then I would pass this file name as an argument as well and it would install it no problems as well but I don't really want to do that at the moment I want to show you a different way of doing it if you're wondering why it is being repeated twice this is for free and this is for non-free Excellent. What we want is the command line setup using RPM. It says here Fedora 14 to the most current. So mine is 20. It's going to work there. No problems as well. So you have this very long command and you don't really need to know what every single portion of this command is or what it does. Basic sum total it imports a repository into your system that you are going to use later on they have given this command so you can do it from from one tap basically you don't need to go about doing things or anything of a kind you basically just copy paste this and run it you are using your default package manager you're using local install option you are not checking for certain types of keys you are uh, giving it, you're giving it the place from which to pull it and so on and so forth but later on as we progress through this tutorial we will deal extensively with Linux command line so only then will these things become clearer to you once we actually once I actually explain some of the basic and fundamental things then you will be able to understand things such as uh, such as those listed in this bracket sorry not bracket within the confines of this parentheses and so on because in, if I start explaining it now it would make no sense and it would simply complicate things further as I said later on when we get into the command line interface of Linux when I start explaining it in great detail uh, there I will begin from scratch and move you move you basically from beginner to advanced user in a relatively short amount of time and then you will be able to understand what all of these things are for the time being just copy copy this uh, content which is within the confines of these quotation marks and paste it into your terminal so you do need to be root let me just go ahead and exit I am no longer root as you can see I am now my regular user, Chronic. Just type in su, type in your password, 
and paste this. Press enter. Okay, obviously it won't install here because I already have it installed. Yeah, it says nothing to do of whatsoever. But on your system where you do not have RPM Fusion installed, this would just fly as well, this would just pass, no problems, and you would successfully have installed RPM Fusion on your system as well. So clear. Anyway, I just wanted to show you something else that I neglected to show you a moment ago. This command that we've ran, it actually installs free and non-free repositories. Uh, if you just take a closer look to what I am highlighting at the moment, this is the free, so it says uh, HTTP download one dot RPM fusion dot org slash free slash Fedora slash RPM fusion free release. And down below you have the second address, again download RPM fusion dot org and it says non free. So I'm highlighting the entire thing here. Let me just zoom it in a bit more so everybody can see. And there you go. You have two completely, well, they're not completely different addresses, but they are definitely different addresses referring to different types of repositories. Anyway, now you can go back to your terminal. Uh, do not log out of root. Stay as, stay root because you will need to be, you, did, you will need root privileges in order to do this. Type in yum, search once again, virtual box, press enter, uh, take the last one or whatever one suits your current kernel. You check the current kernel by typing in uname a, and here, here you go. So I'm 318.7.100. 18700 FC20 FC20 and then you have the architecture listed here as well. So clear the screen, type in yum install, paste the name of the package, uh, press space dash y and if you have this command just press enter and it will install, it will run through I have already installed VirtualBox to save some time as well. You will have it up and running on your system and after you've installed it, do not forget to run, type in yum update as well. So let the, I'll let the system just run through the updates so you would make sure that you have the latest version, that you have everything up to date and running. In any case, uh, that would be it for this tutorial in the next one. I will start VirtualBox up, explaining some of its features, and hopefully through the follow-up tutorials I will start installing an operating system within my virtual machine, within my virtual environment, and we'll see how that process goes. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next tutorial. Hello everybody, and welcome to this tutorial. Today I will go ahead and download Kali Linux and demonstrate the installation procedure as well within a virtual environment. So first off, go ahead and open up your browser, type in Kali Linux, press enter, navigate over to their website. So it's www.kali.org. It's HTTPS, don't forget to check that. Uh, go ahead and navigate over to downloads. Let me just go ahead and zoom in here. Excellent. So here you have uh, images. So it says Kali Linux 64-bit. You can have a direct ISO download, download of an ISO file, or you can go over to the torrents and download it from there. Now, Kali Linux, due to the amount of tools that it has and that come pre-installed, is, is fairly massive for a Linux distro. I mean, it's three gigabytes, which is huge. Uh, yeah, that the download of three gigabytes, it's not just going to fly like that. Well, maybe it will. I don't know what sort of a connection do you have. But for the sake of this tutorial, I have downloaded it prior to this, so we don't have to go 
over through that procedure here of basically waiting for the download itself to happen. But what you want to do, in case you didn't do it, you can just go ahead and click on ISO, click here, save, click OK, and the download procedure will begin. It will be displayed here in the upper right corner. So you see it's, it reports an hour and 20 minutes. I'm just going to go ahead and stop that because I don't want that happening. And then you have the torrent version as well. So you just click on torrents, save file, open up what is displayed here, and it should open up transmission at some point of time. Uh, it's a bit late. Let me just go ahead and try that again. Yep, there we go. So it has a few files marked here. You can just go ahead and click open, and it's going to start the download process. This might be a bit of a faster option depending on the status of Cedars, but it's really up to you. You can't really go wrong, especially if you have a faster internet connection. It, it will not matter that much to you. Let me just go ahead and close the browser. Now I need to go ahead and navigate over to my start menu and pick ver type in VirtualBox virtual and as soon as you type start typing it gives you a list of options so just go ahead and pick this one you might want to pin it to a taskbar or something like that like I have pinned it to my left panel open up virtual box excellent so I have a few machines set up here you can see I have like one two three four five I have five virtual machines set up. I can't run them all at the same time because, well, maybe I could if I reduce the amount of resources that I allot to each one of them, but I will not do that now. For the time being, I want to install a brand new Kali Linux. Before I can do that, I need to do a bit of a configuration. So first off, before the installation procedure starts or anything of a kind, I need to create a new environment in which this machine will be installed. So go ahead and click on new. Type in whatever name you wish. I'm just going to type in Kali so I know what I'm so I know that it's a Kali Linux because I have a lot of other virtual machines here, but you can name it whatever you want. The choice is entirely up to you. Uh, type it's obviously not Microsoft Windows it's Linux and it's not Ubuntu 64 but since it's based on Debian I suppose I can I suppose I can type in Debian 64 Debian 64 bit here not sure if they have Kali probably not there we go they do not have it it doesn't matter if you type in version Debian 64 bit this is gonna work no problems just click next that's it here you will allot the amount of RAM that you wanted to have now it's not it's not RAM intensive it should work fine as it is by default but I'm, I just have a habit of allotting it above one gigabyte for the sake of this tutorial I will allot it to two gigabytes of RAM primarily because we will be working with some of the with some of the programs that can be demanding and that can be resource intensive uh, so I want to do this but don't worry about it if you've uh, given it too much RAM or too little RAM you can always change this later on this is very this is very flexible that's the beauty of VirtualBox that's why I like it so much you can change these at any point of time if you've deemed uh, that you need the resources elsewhere or that you have more resources that you can allot here. So just click next. Uh, just go ahead and click create. Uh, create a virtual hard drive now. That is the drive that this machine will be using and just use this one VDI virtual box disk image. That's the hard drive file type. Click next. Dynamically allocate it. That's very important and you can see you can read here what dynamically allocated means basically it is hard drive file will only use space on your physical hard drive as it fills up up to the maximum fixed size and click next here you will allot the drive space now uh, I, I have a lot of drive space so I'm just gonna go ahead and allot like maybe 120 gigs that that's gonna be more than enough for this undertaking 
since I do have a lot of drive space on my laptop, I don't really care. But if you don't have enough drive space or something like that, you can go ahead and allot it 50 gigabytes or something like that. Should work fine, no problem. 120 is more than I need, way more. So just go ahead and click Create. That's it. Now we have our Kali. Uh, now we have our environment under the name Kali set up. There is just one more thing that we need to do. We need to configure the boot order for this machine, and maybe not the boot order, but rather instead uh, the location of the ISO file which it will pull. So go ahead and right click on it, settings, uh, display storage, click on storage, click on empty. There is this disk icon here. It's when you click on it, it says choose a virtual CD disk file. So I have a few here, but none of these are what I actually need. If you have something in your CD-ROM drive, you can just go ahead and click here, and it's going to pull an image from a CD. But that's not really the case here. We have an ISO file that we want to use, so just go ahead and open it up. Click on Home and I have it in my downloads folder it should be around here somewhere yep there we go Kali Linux 109A AMD 64 I do believe that I'm slightly behind the latest version but we're gonna fix that with updates no problems open it up it says Kali Linux 109A AMD 64 ISO and that is the type of file that we're looking for dot ISO open it up there you go it's now inserted you can see it here the blue markation in the center it's marked and Kali Linux is in the tray so click OK double click on Kali and it says starting now it's running you have a few options here to utilize you can have live AMD 64 live forensic mode USB persistence live USB encrypted persistence or just go ahead and install it so what these options are you have live which, which is basically when it runs from a USB stick or something like that those are the live boots can be USBs, CDs or something of a kind where the system is booted from an external device and that is what people usually do when they want to access certain services which are protected by the current operating system so when you bring it down and when you plug in your USB and boot the system from the USB stick your system it will not recognize any of the file permissions previously set by the system that was installed there on the hard drive of the machine because it is down and then you can I don't know then you can delete stuff that your that the system would not allow you to delete this is one of the way that people have used to actually delete Internet Explorer in Windows more as a joke than anything else just to prove that it's possible and this is also one of the ways in which you can pull the password files in Windows and decrypt them as well so we will deal with that a bit later on when we get into more advanced stuff but you have fail safe mode live fail safe mode well every system pretty much has a fail-safe mode today it's, it's basic boot and it tries to it just loads the basic things and this is practically guaranteed to boot every time you boot in the fail-safe mode unless you've messed something up that is in a very 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 serious way fail-safe mode will boot almost always uh, forensic mode uh, for investigators and such people we're not going to be dealing it dealing with it in this fashion because we don't want the live we want the installed version and then you have live USB persistence so this is a very nice feature that you can have for example you can have an operating system Kali Linux or many other distros installed on a USB stick and you can have a rather large USB stick like I don't know 256 gigs or something of a kind it doesn't need to be that big it can be a lot smaller but the bigger the better primarily because of this persistence flag uh, you can work and work and all of your work will be saved on that USB hard drive so you can make permanent changes 
to a live to a live CD. No, well, generally not to a CD. This is this is a USB. I do believe that there is a way of doing this with a CD as well, but nobody does that anymore. Just have a USB stick and you'll be fine. Uh, you see the first version, the live one, it means when you take it out, when you shut it down, it will forget any and all changes made to it. But when you have live USB with persistence, you can have those changes remembered. You can write them down. So next time you boot it, they will load. And here you have another great option. It's live USB encrypted persistence. So what this means is basically that your old information contained on your live USB will be encrypted and if you happen to lose it nobody will be able to access your data so provided of course that you have something sensitive there worth protecting and of course I mean you would still lose the data but you would ensure that no one can actually access it or anything of a kind so if you lose it if you have some passwords or something like that stored there oh well no big deal you know it's encrypted nobody's gonna be able to break it provided of course that you have a long enough encryption key in any case uh, in the follow-up tutorial I will go ahead and proceed with the installation notice that we will need to install a few more things because look at this I'm resizing the screen now and once I go past a certain size I can no longer increase the size of my screen of my virtual screen rather instead I'm just increasing its edges and that is because we need something called guest additions for virtual box guest additions enable full screen displays of virtual machines but more of that to come in the next tutorial and I hope I'll see you all there Hello everybody and welcome to this tutorial. Today I will continue from where I left off in the previous one. Now if you remember we issued app-get update and app-get upgrade commands. That took a while to finish and process. I was prompted once. I was given a readme file in regards to wget program, wget packet. And the way you go about, the way you handle it is you press Q to exit. You do not close the terminal and terminate the updates. Rather, instead, you just press Q to exit the readme file and the update process will continue no problems. So today, we need to configure the, repos the sources uh, list. Those are the list of repositories from which your Linux distro actually pulls various packets and information from. Just like Fedora, Kali Linux also has uh, repositories, and if you go onto their website, you see the link is here. I have marked it. You have these four repositories that are the default repositories of Kali Linux, and you can just go ahead and copy paste them. Not a bad idea to do this. And I, I, sometimes I don't know why, but I don't find them by default in the repository list in the sources list, so I got to do it manually you go ahead and basically type in cd slash etsy slash apt oops apt ls and there you go you have sources dot list and go ahead and type nano sources dot list press enter and there you are now in the repository file in the repository file this is where they are listed this is where you can type them in so let's just go ahead and copy these two. I'm not going to worry about any duplicates now or anything of a kind. Uh, duplicate repositories are not going to break anything, so no worries. The system is smart enough to realize that for itself. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy the four of these. Later on, if we want, we can sort this out and remove the duplicates or something of a kind. But for the time being, it doesn't matter. It's not going to break anything. Just copy all four of them. Press Control o Enter, Control x to exit and there you go so once again control o to save a file so press control o enter and then control x to exit excellent now that we got that sorted out we need to clear the screen and even though we've actually put placed our repositories there it doesn't matter the system will still not be able to pick anything up from them until we actually perform the following so we need to do apt dash get the space update 
So we're not upgrading the system, we're just updating the repository lists. This is gonna this is this should this should go through relatively fast and at the end it is most likely going to report duplicates, but that is fine, that is okay, there is no problem there. If you're wondering why are we doing this, well we do need these repositories in order to install the necessary headers for Kali Linux kernel, which we will need in order to install VirtualBox guest editions to get full screen functionality. Because if we continue to work like this in this mini in this smaller screen, uh, it it wouldn't be good, trust me. Primarily because we're gonna be doing a lot of things, we're gonna need a lot of windows that are open and that can present problems. So there you go. It's not a, it's not an error. It's a W, so it's a warning. It says duplicate sources list, duplicate sources list, duplicate sources list. No big deal there. We can correct these problems later on if we wish, but for the time being, there is no need. Let me just go ahead and clear the screen. And now what I want to do is install two more packages which will allow me to actually install and run VirtualBox guest editions. So I have a pre-built command here for you that I'm going to run. It goes like this, basically. You have apt-get. You're calling the packet manager. You're telling it to do an update. But since we already did a few updates, I don't actually need that portion of the command. I'm just going to go ahead and use app-get install-y. And then I have dkms. That's one package. And then I have another package. Because you can specify a lot of packages here, as many as you like, pretty much. And then I have Linux headers, dash. And what this here is, this is a variable this dollar sign. This is some sort of variable, a string, uh, and whatever this command, you name space dash r outputs, it will be stored into this variable and it will be added to this text line here. So let me just show you. I have you name dash r that I ran here on my terminal and what I got was the kernel version and the system architecture 62, 64 or 32-bit. I'm just going to go ahead and press enter. There is nothing to do as I have previously installed them. I didn't want to waste time during the tutorial, but this command is going to fly without any problems, especially because you have dash y argument. You're basically saying uh, to your packet manager, if you have any questions for me, just answer them all with yes. So that went just fine. Uh, the install process, I'm just going to go ahead and run app-get uh, upgrade. Uh, you want to make sure that this happens after the installation. I already did it, but just uh, doing a bit of a show here. And it says that two of them are not upgraded. It says Metasploit and Metasploit Framework, but it says that the packages have been kept back, so this is being done for a valid reason. We will get into that a bit later on, but for the time being, let me just go ahead and clear the screen. One of the first things that we need to do now is go ahead and click on Devices, Insert, Guest Edition CD Image. And yep, there we go, it popped. This is a warning that Kali Linux issues and that many other Linux type operating systems issue. Every, if you have content that is on a CD or a USB or something like that, and if it's configured to run automatically, the system will block it and then it will ask you for a permission. So the medium contains software intended to be automatically started. Would you like to run it? I'm going to go ahead and click run and most likely get an error. There we go. Error out to running software. Cannot find the auto run program. Now, the error message, uh, yeah, it's, it doesn't really tell us much in this case. I guess we could take a look at the log files and so on and so forth. But here is the solution which you can apply, as this is a common problem that people encounter all the time. So there are some standardized solutions and patches to this sort of problems. So just go ahead and type in the terminal cd to change the, to change the working directory. Navigate over to where the VirtualBox guest edition cd is, which is, you can use the same path that I'm using, so media, and then ls, and then cd again, uh, cd, cd rom zero. Excellent. So we are now here, and look, I have a listing of pretty much all the contents of the CD. 
basically. This is a virtual CD. It's not a real one, uh, but it works pretty much just the same. So this is the file that I want. I want to move it from here, so I'm just going to go ahead and use command CP. You can also use move command, but you're permanently going to remove it from here, and that is not what we want to do. So just type in CP for copy. Uh, type the name of whatever you wish to copy. Very simple. And then specify the path to where you want the file to be copied. I want it to be copied in my home directory. Press enter, and there we go. Now navigate over to your home directory get a listing excellent it is there the way to run any script in Linux any executable file in general not just the script is just to press uh, dot slash and then the name of that file press enter there we go it is running the guest editions are being installed I have I have uh, attempted this process before just to make sure that everything would run smoothly and that's why it says removing existing things Anyway, it might take a while for it to finish, but I assure you it will. Uh, there's a lot of to, there's a lot of things to do, and that's why that that is why it's taking a bit of a bit more of your time. Now, aside from the full screen functionality that we're gonna get by installing VirtualBox guest editions, just in case you think it's a bit of a pointless effort, if you are a student, because I, as a teacher, I have to have the full screen so you can see everything. Uh, you also have under devices drag and drop and shared clipboard what these op well drag and drop you the name itself is self it's self explanatory you just pull a file from somewhere and then pull it onto your virtual machine or vice versa but i don't like to enable drag and drop what i do, but what i do like to do is enable shared clipboard host to guest now here's why i use my browser on my host machine primarily because i you tend to watch a video or two somewhere about something and you don't really want to bother go about installing flash on Kali Linux it can be problematic so host guest copying copy pasting is very useful and you will need it I assure you now there is a way there is a shared folder settings you can either construct a shared folder or you can have a localized web server on both machines where you can pull the information from and put the information there if configured properly but shared folder said shared folders are better for such purposes anyway you can review what has happened here it has been listed here the most important part of it all is that you don't have any reports of anything failing so let's just go ahead and go over it so all good here guest edition no failures here none here copying additional star modules installing them done 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 excellent installing the window system drivers very important done done or just restart the system the window system okay so let's me just go ahead and attempt to re restart the graphics so in it run level 3 nope in it run level 5 will this work nope apparently it works on Fedora but perhaps the command is a bit different here I'm just gonna go ahead and type in uh, reboot at uh, reboot is a lot safer option in it 3 and 5 there are run modes of Linux one is basically without any graphical interface pure text and the other one is with a GUI the safer option when you conduct uh, installation of such packages that relate to the kernel directly and especially if you have several of them is simply to reboot the machine just to be on the safe side it doesn't take up a lot of your time it is very it happens very fast and it's a, a lot safer option it's gonna save you a lot of headaches in the future excellent so we have our boot here just press enter and let's just close go ahead and close this let me just load the full screen and let us see if it will actually happen if the VirtualBox guest editions that we have installed will work if they do work great if they don't we're gonna have to try something else as these things do have a tendency to break and problems can occur so it's booting come on okay I need to log in first root and test below 
Excellent, there we go. I have a full screen. Let me just... Oops, the image is being adjusted. Excellent, there you have it. So we have Kali Linux now running in full screen mode, which is fantastic. Now we have a full overview of the situation. If I open up my terminal and... Oops, the scroll doesn't seem to work. It needs to be configured manually. So if you zoom in, that's, that's one of the things that I find very annoying about Kali Linux, but... Oops, yep, there we go. That's it. That's how you zoom in. What? Control plus minus. Zoom out. And view, zoom in. Control plus plus. Okay. So I am pressing control plus plus. But it seems to be minimizing things. Oh well, what can you do about it? Doesn't really matter. I will enlarge it later on as we progress through the tutorial. There are a few things that can be rather buggy here. Especially with the keyboard keys that you are using because it's a virtual machine. If you were using Kali Linux as your main machine, as your host machine, you wouldn't have such problems, but as I have stated previously, it is not a recommended option. In any case, uh, that would be it for this tutorial. Th these are pretty much all the preparations that you needed to make. And next up, we're going to get into the Linux command line interface. I need to acquaint you with it, even though we have done some of the commands, they are a very small portion of what we need to learn, and I do need to explain them to you because we're going to be using Linux command line a lot. Basically, whatever we do, we're going to need it. And with that, I bid you farewell and sincerely hope to see you in the next tutorial. Hello everybody and welcome to this tutorial. Today I will introduce you to the Linux terminal and show you some of its basic functionalities. So in Kali Linux, terminal icon is located in the upper left corner, this black thing. So just click on it and there you go. You have the terminal up and running here. By default it opens up a root terminal in Kali. So if you want to, usually people want to configure it, but if you want to, if you don't want to configure anything else, this is perfectly fine. You don't actually need to do anything else. However, 99% of the time, people will configure the terminal f to suit their own needs and purposes. For example, I will always, almost always, increase the font size so that it is clear and visible and that I have a better overview of what I am doing at the moment and it also reduces eye strain according to some articles. Anyway, so just go ahead and uh, right click anywhere on the terminal itself, not on the bar, but on the terminal itself. And then you have show menu bar. Now we can see it here. Go ahead and click on edit. You can click on profiles as well and create new profiles here by just typing in, by just clicking on new, giving it the name and then configuring it in the preferences. However, uh, we're going to be configuring the default profile since there really is no need to create any additional ones. Go ahead and click on profile preferences and here you have a great deal of options. One of the first ones that you will see is that you can use a system fixed with font. So this is not good. You see, this is very small. You do need. I I always need to change that. If that's fine for you, you can keep it like that. But I always change it. And I have mono space twenty. If you click on it, you can change the font size here. If you wish, you can change the font that you're using. And that would be it as far as this place is concerned. You have some other very simple options here. It says show menu bar by default in new terminals. I generally take it. I think it's a good idea since you always need to do something like open up a new tab or something of a kind, but you don't need to. You have the cursor shape here. It says block, I beam, underline. Just want to show you how it looks like. You can view the terminal as the changes are applied. So you have a block and you have an underline. I prefer a block. You can use whatever you wish. It will not affect you. It will not affect you in any, te in any technical sense, that is have title and command. Uh, we don't actually need to change anything there. You can change the title if you wish. We have colors. So I think that this color scheme is appropriate and fitting for me, but you can change it any way you like. You can customize it to the point of extreme. 
uh, you can change the text color, the background color, you have the pal color, color palette here, so you can do whatever you want here. You have built-in schemes, so you have, it says white on black, I can say green on black, or, oops, sorry, cancel, I can say green on black. Uh, does it have blue on black? No, black, oh, this one's bad, I wouldn't be able to work on this one. So let's just leave it at black on uh, white on black. Sorry, this is the best color. This is one of the best color schemes I use. A personally, I use on Fedora blue on black, but I'm just gonna leave it as it is here. No need to actually change anything. Now in background, there's an in, there. Are, you have three features here basically. You have solid color like this one here that you are seeing, and you ca you can choose a background image. You can download anything you want from the internet pretty much. You can configure it to be transparent or image background. And also you have the ability to have a trans fully transparent background. And if you click on transparent background, it's pretty much the same as having a background image, except in this case, excellent, I'm just gonna configure it to transparency levels and that's pretty good. Except in this case, your background image will be your desktop image, pretty much, depending on where your terminal is. In scrolling, there's an important feature here. It's scroll back, so you don't want to have 512 lines. You want to go ahead and click on unlimited, unless you're severely limited in terms of RAM and unless you're typing in a large amount of commands or something of a kind. But in any case, it's better to have unlimited, especially in environment, especially in not only in environments such as these, but rather instead in cases such as these. You don't need to do anything here in terms of compat compatibility. I'm just going to go ahead and close this and I have selected a transparent background. And you see this only works for a desktop image. It doesn't actually show icons or anything of a kind. If I open up my web browser, it's not going to show it in the background. It's still going to keep the uh, desktop background image. So the desktop wallpaper, should you wish to call it so. There's a slight delay when it goes about in the update, but it's fine. Doesn't bother us in the slightest bit. Maybe I will change this later on during the tutorial, see how I like it, but I just wanted to give you an option so you can do whatever you want with it. In any case, you can go ahead and click on File and Open Tab. I'm just going to go ahead and open myself four tabs, three new ones and one that I already had. So here you can switch in between them. It's very nice. There's no there are no complications. For example, if I press open up a new terminal, I got to click here and then I got to click here and usually you're going to have I'm just want to show you what it's like to have four of them. So, yeah, this is not actually manageable, especially because you don't know what you are doing on which terminal. People sometimes split their screens into terminals. I sometimes do that. It's very nice, but we will deal with that a bit later on when we get into some serious stuff when we actually need multiple terminals. But tabs, it's uh, tabbing these tab, tabbing these terminals. It's very nice, primarily because you can actually see what you're doing on each one of them in the header. See these things that I'm selecting that I'm clicking on now, they are headers of the terminal, or so you can call them. And if I, for example, in this terminal, I'm going to go ahead and say I want you to go into home, change directory to home, change the working directory that is. And if I change it here to var, and if I change it here to var logs, uh, and if I want to go here to DMP folder. Excellent. So on each of these tabs, uh, in their headers, I can see where I am. So this this one, it's home. Uh, this one, it's DMP. I don't need to click on it to know. This one is log. So I can know what I'm doing in every particular terminal. And even though you can have a programming or something like that, it's still going to write it out in the header and you're going to get some extra information there. It's very nice, very useful, and it's going to help you out a lot as we progress through this course and as we get into more complicated stuff. 
Anyway, I just want to introduce you to the Linux terminal. We have done some work with it before during the installation of VirtualBox and VirtualBox guest editions. But basically there, I've just given you the command and you're going to basically just rewrite it or copy paste it. And that's going to be it. But here I will, in the follow-up tutorial actually, I will start explaining the fundamental Linux terminal commands, the most common ones, the basic ones. And there you will be able to see the logic of things and how this Linux terminal works and functions. Because once you actually learn that, it gives you a huge amount of power, all the power of an operating system rests on its terminal because it's a direct interface to the kernel of the system and it's a lot faster than the graphical interface. Now one more keynote that I would like to make here. Uh, once I teach you how to use the Linux terminal and once you get into habit of typing in commands you can use them for a wide variety of purposes. You ne not necessarily need to use these things uh, for pen testing or something like that. You can use these commands for network administration or you can use them in order to troubleshoot problems with the system and so on and so forth. So you get a you get a far wider spectrum of options in terms of jobs or something of a kind as opposed to just learning something that you can only use for pen testing and nothing else. In any case, I bid you farewell and I hope to see you in the next tutorial. Hello everybody and welcome to this tutorial. Today I will go over a few basic commands which you will need in order to follow this course through. Now these basic commands uh, they are for term they're, they're used in order to navigate within the terminal or through the file system to figure out where you are at the moment to copy things, move things, uh, get listings of files, folders, see the contents, remove them, change the change the ownership of files or change the modes of files. You will see shortly what I mean. So first off we have CD which is change directory. So if I just type in CD uh, slash home I am going to navigate over to my home directory. Uh, CD stands for change directory as I said before you are literally changing the, your working directory. If you type in cd double dot, you, you, are, you will always go one step back. So double dot is always the previous folder. Bit of a shortcut there, you will use it fairly often. Next up we have ls. ls shows you the listing of the current folder uh, contents, but you can also use ls slash, for example, home and you get the listing of a specified folder as well. Typing ls in and of its own will give you the listing of the current folder as opposed to typing ls and then a path to a folder which will give you a listing of a specified folder. In addition to that you also have ls-l which will give you a long listing so it will tell you who the, who the owners are, the size, the date, uh, the type, the permissions, and so on and so forth. However, one of the more common usages of ls is dash la to show the hidden files as well. You might notice that I am not using ll like I was using, like I generally use in Fedora, because bash ll command not found. I guess I could install it here as well, but it doesn't really matter. It performs fairly similar function as ls does, but it's a bit faster to type in. So I'm just going to go ahead and clear this. Next up is pwd which prints working directory and you might find this a bit confusing but slash in all Linux Unix like system it simply refers to the root directory to the beginning to the root directory. So you remain from where all where all the files are located and from where everything begins so to say. But let me just make it a bit clearer. I'm going to navigate over to home and then do pwd. You can see that I am in home at the moment. So print working directory does exactly what the name itself says. It prints your current working directory. Next up we have our cp command which we already have used in order to copy VirtualBox guest editions from one place to another. Fairly simple. You type in cp path to path 
uh, let's not do it like that. Let's do a real example. So if I, for example, go ahead and type in CP VBox guest editions, Linux edition, sorry, dot run. And if I, let's say, want to copy it to somewhere, let's say that I wish to copy it to var. I will delete it, of course, and I'll show you how to do that as well. But it's fairly simple. And if I want, like, sir, well, I don't want recursion, I just want a verbosity. There you go. So CP, VBOC, you specify what you want to copy and where you want to copy it to. Keep in mind that you could have actually typed in here a folder, a full path to this VirtualBox guest editions dot run. You didn't actually need to be in the home directory. And this dash V option gives us this. So it tells us what was copied where. Very useful option. Let me just show you what would happen if I didn't have that. Oops, just like this. Nothing. There is no output or anything of a kind. Now this is this is fairly simple when you have one very small file and you don't really care, but when you have a large file, let's say 20 gigabytes or so, and you are copying it, you're just going to have a blank screen below. Nothing will be happening. You will not be able to figure out that the copy, whether the copying process is going on or whether it has actually crashed, bugged, or something of a kind. So just pass a dash, w, dash V option, which is uh, always useful to have simply because the machine actually tells you what it is doing. Now you might have noticed that all of these commands, more or less, they have their own arguments which can be passed to them in order to modify what the command does. You can view a listing of these arguments, you do not need to memorize them all. So just let's let's take an example of CP, I'm going to do dash dash help. So this is a universal way of getting uh, help on a particular subject within the terminal. You type in the command space dash dash help press enter and you get a listing of possibilities. So I know it looks a bit messy and a bit difficult to see, but you don't actually need to uh, look at all of these things here. You just scroll upwards and there you go. You can see all the arguments. They are listed clearly here. Uh, you have the argument here and then you have an explanation of what that argument does. Over the uh, For the time being, you're not going to be able to memorize all of these, but over the time, you as you practice more and more and as you start doing and as you start actually uh, using these commands you will be remembering more and more and more and more without actually wishing it. Basically you'll be caching the information so to say. Anyway over here in the upper in the upper part of this help menu you get usage. So in usage you get the format or the syntax of the command. So basically CP you pass an option and then you specify you specify your source and destination. Very simple, no problems there. Uh, this is universal for all of the commands. You can always use the help menu. However, in addition to the help menu, you also have uh, man pages. So if I type in man, and I'm gonna use a command pwd, man pages on pwd basically give me a download of information. You can see, okay, obviously it gives you the name, uh, it's called synopsis here, but basically the syntax of the command. You get a description, full description of what the command does, full description of the arguments. You even get the author who, who, who actually wrote it, some notes, copyright, and uh, some references to something else as well. Uh, this is a very short man page because pwd is a very short command and a very basic command. But for example, if I was to type in man, gr sorry, grep, you can see that the man page is a lot bigger as I'm just scrolling down and it seems to be on end. Grep is a multi-purpose command, which I will show to you in a moment. But I just wanted to tell you, but I just wanted to show the difference between a basic and a more complex command. Let me just go ahead and clear the screen. Next up, we have move. So MV uh, that will cause a folder to move. This is how you rename folders to or files. So let's just go ahead and navigate over to var, where I have actually copied this file. 
LS, excellent. So if I say move VBox guest edition, Linux editions, I can move it either to some different folder under some different name, or I can just rename it within my current folder. So if I just type it in, uh, I don't know, let's, let's, let's go ran, sorry, random is not so random. I'm just going to rename it to that and say dot run. You can put whatever extension you want. Of course, it won't function the same, but I am just showing you the way of renaming a file. And if I do ls again, you see that this is that vbox Linux editions dot run has been successfully renamed to random is not so random dot run. I can also do this. I can, for example, move random is not so random to my home directory. And if I do ls and then specify a path to my home directory and press enter, you can see that I have actually moved it here. But unlike the copy command, it doesn't retain the original within uh, f where the destination, wherever that destination, wherever the source might have been. So once you move it, it's gone from the desti from the source folder. However, it's going to appear in the destination one. Also, a tricky way when you delete something with move, when you move something over something else, uh, it's so difficult to recover, if not impossible. Also, be very careful with deleting files. Uh, in Linux, because once you delete them from the terminal, it's near, it's next, I mean, you will not be able to recover them, basically. it. There are some complex procedures that might give you the fraction of what you wanted to recover, but if you remove it from the terminal, it's very, very, very difficult. It's not like Windows or something of a kind. When you delete something in Windows, you can always recover it. Basically, you didn't even delete it, nonetheless, something else. You just don't see it. But here, when you delete something, it's gone permanently. So take great caution, take great care, uh, but don't be afraid. I mean, over the time, over a certain period of time, these things become second nature to you, and you will worry, you will take it into consideration without even thinking about it. So let's just go ahead and clear the screen. Next up, we have cat. Now, cat gives us well, let me show you what cat does. So, ran Oops, I cannot cat the random. Ah, because it is not there, of course. So let's just navigate over to home and let's cat. Uh, random is not so random. And you see what it does. It actually shows you the listing of... Well, this is a bit of a longer file. So it shows you all the entire contents of that file, whatever that might be. Uh, not not for, this content is not pretty at all you can't basically read it like this but doesn't matter let's just create another com let's just create another another file and i'm just gonna cat it so nano is my favorite text editor from the terminal you will need to learn how to use terminal text editors because primarily you don't want to be switching back and forth between gui uh, text editors and working on something in a terminal. It's extremely time consuming. And plus here on Kali Linux, you can actually edit things with root. However, if you are, for example, using some other distribution or something of a kind, most of the GUI text editors will not be, you will not be able to run them as root. You will get an error message. So that can be a bit problematic. That's why you should always learn how to use text editors that are terminal text editors. So just type in nano and type in the name of the file that you wish to create. So for example, I'm just going to go ahead and type in uh, test. This is going to be a test file. No need to give it any extensions or anything of a kind. And there we go. Now we are in the nano text editor. So here I can, for example, write some text, some random text goes here. Let's just do that. Okay, so you have a wide variety of options down here. Well, maybe not a wide variety, but certainly a good amount. So this is uh, this caret sign X. It simply means Control X. So if you press Control X, you're gonna exit. Control O, write out. That's basically save. 
you don't need this. Uh, where is is basically the way to search things. So Control V, search, and no, let's say random. Press Enter, and there you go. It's gonna point to random. It's going to find it, no problems. Uh, previous page, you don't need that. Next page, you're not gonna be uh, that engaged with it. So cut text is also very nice because it allows you to actually remove large portions of text at a relatively fast rate. So if I just say Control K, it's going to remove the current line where the cursor is, not what you have selected with your mouse, just so you know. Let me just bring that back. And I'm just going to go ahead and continue talking about this in part two in the follow-up tutorial. Until then, I bid you farewell. Hello, everybody, and welcome to part two of this tutorial. And now let's go ahead and save the file. So press Control O to write the to output to the file. It says file file name to write. You can actually modify it here. So you can type in some letters or whatever you want. You can change the name here, or you can even change the extension the extension if you want. But there is no need for the time being. I'm just going to go ahead and save it as test. Just press Enter. There you go. It says wrote one line. Control X to exit. There we go clear the screen and now I'm going to use cat command to get a listing of this particular file which is far more reasonable than the previous one which you couldn't read the cat command by the way was functioning properly but it was mostly a binary file therefore it I mean it gave you a listing but you couldn't really read anything from it so let's just go ahead and type in cat test and there we go. It says some random text goes here. That is the text that we have typed into the typed into the text file and test file and you can cat it like this. These things are very good especially with files that you want to make sure not you want to you do not want to change them in any way and you don't want to make any accidental changes or anything of a kind and you want to quickly see what is located within that file. There is another way of doing this. Basically, it's less. And let's go ahead and navigate over to Etsy, apt, ls. And here we have plenty of files to work with. So let's just take sources.list as an example here. So if I do cat source sources.list, I'm going to get everything that is within that file as before and it's going to be listed in my terminal here there to stay it's not going to go away anywhere but there is another command which I can use let me just go ahead and clear the screen it is called less and if I type in less sources.list I'm going to be prompted with a new tab where I can actually view things here not a new terminal tab but a new workspace within the within the terminal itself and when I press Q, it's going to exit and nothing will be displayed here. So very nice in terms of being neat and organized uh, and so on and so forth. So less and cat, very nice things. But you can use, for example, cat sources.list. And then the command that I have previously mentioned is grep. Grep means basically you pull something, you grab something from something else. Now here's what I mean by it. You type in cat sources.list and you type in a pipe. This symbol here it's called a pipe which basically states whatever the output of this is pipe it to the whatever to whatever command comes here. So I'm just gonna type in grep and let's say I want to type in src. Press enter. Excellent. So it will only print lines that have src in them. Uh, Linux is case sensitive so when you are grepping it's gonna check whether it's gonna check the case of the letters whether it's lowercase or not. But you can you can give it an ignore case you can type in like this dash i means ignore case oops I bad dash i to ignore the case uh, you're gonna get the same output because there are no different things within this file but you get you get the general idea. So this is how you would use cat with grep in order to pull things out of a file. Very important. This is a huge part of the Linux terminal uh, filtering through text files primarily because we're going to be doing large network scans and we will want to 
create files from which we will be able to pull useful information which we will later in turn pass to other tools to do something with. Anyway, let me just go ahead and clear the screen for the time being. You also have echo, so echo, and I give it the quotation marks open. Let's say, I am alive, close quotation marks, and it will echo these words. It literally is an echo. You type something into it, and it echoes them here. So let's just go back to the home directory now, get a listing and use exactly the same command echo live by the way you can scroll through the previous commands by using arrow key so up and up arrow, using the up arrow key and down arrow key you can scroll back through the previous commands and you don't need to retype them so I am alive and I'm going to insert this so I'm going to use a greater than sign and type in test so this will echo I am alive into test and if I do less I'm going to use cat test. You see, it has replaced the contents of the test, which was some random text goes here, into I am alive. Very nice command to have. You can change variable names, uh, variable values with echo and so on and so forth. We will use this a bit more as we progress through the course and I don't really want to get in, in depth here primarily because later on when we have clear examples uh, that directly relate to what we are doing at the moment which is basically pen testing then you will see more advanced usage of pretty much all of these commands especially grep. We have touch Touch is a quick way to create files. So for example, I can do touch and I can say file one, file two, file three. Press enter, ls, and you see it has immediately created three files. So touch is a very quick method. Oops, a bit gone, but a bit over my head there. Anyway, touch is a very quick way of creating any amount of files that you wish and you can specify folder paths, you can create this file in home, this one in var, this one in var log, and so on and so forth. Anyway, down below you have mkdir, so if I go ahead and type in mkdir, it's make directory. So you are making some sort of a directory, let's say uh, this, the name of this directory will be place to be. And if I get ls, there we go. It states that this that this uh, that this file is actually a directory which is a place to be. I can even navigate to it and say place to be ls. There is nothing in it, but get the idea. You can make directories in such a fashion. Now ch own. If I type ch own, it allows you to change the ownership of a particular file. Now since we only have a single user here, which is root, there isn't really any point in doing so unless we create some other new users, but we're not going to do that as we don't need them. But just to show you how this would work, for example, if you were, if the owner of a file was not root, and if you wanted to change it to root, you would do the following. So ch own, and then you would type the name, the username, colon, the user group. So the user group and the username are usually the same on your home PCs unless you're on some bigger server or something like that. And then you would just specify the name of the file. I don't know, you can type in test. There we go. So it will change it will effectively change the ownership of file test to the username root who is from the user group root. And if I do ls la you can see here it states who the who the owners are and which groups actually own the files as well. So if I clear the screen, there is another there is another more used command. It's called ch mode, and this command allows you to change file permissions. So this is something that you will need to use on a daily basis and quite often, primarily because, well, you see, if I have an executable file in Linux, for example. Let's just go ahead and edit. Well, actually, we don't need to edit it. We can type in echo, echo, and uh, not like that. Hello, close quotation marks, and I want to output this to test, and I want to move 
test to test dot sh sh is basically an executable one of the one of the script one of the scripts that's a bash script for Linux that in such a way you can automate tasks we will deal with it in greater depth as we proceed through the tutorial you will need to be acquainted with bash scripting definitely but bash scripting is very similar to the terminal itself so pretty much all the commands that you use in the terminal you can use in bash scripting as well basically just combining a bunch of them in a file and now I want this to be my executable but you see the way to to start executables is dot slash as I have stated previously that's a command to start any executable and if I type in test and I press tab it doesn't give me a list of possibilities why surely now test dot sh is an executable but no you see it doesn't have a permission to be an executable file you see here the difference that just take a look at this file and take a look at this file this one is green this one is not and now look at their permissions so you see it has a markation that it is executable for all groups users etc while this one up here test sh does not have such permissions you need to change that and in the way you change it is ch mod and you would type in plus x so if you want if you want the file to be writable you type in plus w if you want it to be executable plus x if you want to be able to read the file plus r very simple there is also a way of doing this with numbers so you can type in 755 uh, you don't you don't try remembering all those modes whatever you need you basically go on the net and check it's it can be quite complicated but these three you need to know it's plus w plus r and plus x and also 777 which is a global mode this is this is the mode that is not recommended for actual usage but you use ch mode to actually test or troubleshoot things for example if you want to be absolutely sure that certain actions are not being prevented due to file permissions you change the mode of those files to 777 which is the global mode that anybody can do anything with the file and if you still have an error message you know that it is absolutely not related to anything in regards to permissions so those those four things you do need to know so let me just go ahead and type in plus x type in random up oh, not random it's not so random type in type in test dot sh press enter and if i do ls la once again you will see that test dot sh is now executable let me just run it and there you go if i run this it's gonna echo hello onto my terminal screen now there are there is a there's a bit more to go not much more left there is just one more command that I would really like to show to you and that can be a very dangerous command indeed it can mess you up in ways you can't you can't even begin to imagine yet that is the command RM so RM is basically remove and once you remove things with this command it's, it's next to impossible to recover pretty much anything so if I type in RM test.sh it's going to remove it and it's no longer going to be there but if I go ahead and navigate over to place to be and I don't know touch test gonna make a new full file there and if I go ahead and say rm place to be it's gonna say rm cannot remove place to be because it is a directory this is a fail safe of the rm uh, so you wouldn't delete a full directory because you wouldn't be able to recover it and that would be really bad what you can do is type in rm dot f and then place to be cannot remove directory oops okay no problems you see you get stuck and I'm deliberately gonna leave this part in the tutorial just to troubleshoot it so you type in dash dash help and here you have recursive remove directories and their contents recursively so that's a that's a very nice option so let's just go ahead and do that because this will go into the folder and remove everything within the folder and the folder itself hopefully so let's just go ahead and type in rm r place to be press enter there you go it has deleted it and there we go it is no longer there the the, the dash f function dash 
f that I have used is forced it will not ask you any questions it will delete the folder or file which can be also very dangerous you also, you, when you're using RM you always want to be asked questions in any case uh, I have as I said I've deliberately left this in order to show you that even if you get stuck don't worry about it I get stuck all the time and if you don't know what to type in what argument to pass just type in dash dash uh, dash dash help and take a look at what you can actually type read read a little bit and then use the options try it out it's sometimes it's gonna work sometimes it won't but more often than not you will be able to figure it out from the help menu if you can't figure it out from the help menu just type in man rm and you can read pretty much everything that there is to know about this command here and if you really can't perform the task but uh, if you can't find anything useful here then forums are your next best bet but trust me you will succeed in doing it in any case this was a brief introduction to some of the basic commands that we will use uh, please make sure that you know what each one of these commands does at least its basic functions and then later on we will get in depth and do more advanced stuff and use more advanced commands by combining them and so on in any case, I bid you all farewell, and I hope to see you in the next tutorial. Hello everybody, and welcome to this tutorial. Today I will open up a chapter on how to stay anonymous. So there are several ways, uh, several methods that you can use. First off, you've probably heard about these things. They are proxies. So you are just routing your connection through several different points, although this can be very slow depending on the speed of the proxies elsewhere. and you also know nothing of the other side. You know nothing of the servers through which your packets are going. So that can be risky, but then again, if you're trying, if you're just scanning something, if you're end mapping a network, if you're using nmap to footprint a network, why do you care? It's not of importance. However, if you're using proxies to log in somewhere or pass credentials or something of a kind that is potentially dangerous and you should not do that I mean it's quite quite literally you shouldn't do it the other option is to use some sort of VPNs and to encrypt your networks to encrypt your to encrypt your traffic between you and the VPN service provider now these things can be very fast depending on which one you have so you can just pay for a service out there I think a, a yearly subscription is like a hundred and something bucks a monthly subscription is like 10 bucks something like that you get a dedicated VPN static IP address so you can do you can do a lot of stuff and it's very they are they can be very 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 fast furthermore your traffic is encrypted as I said and the only way that somebody can figure out that you are doing something somewhere is uh, if the VPN service provider actually relinquishes your information however this does not happen that often this is very difficult to attain especially if you get a VPN some in certain parts of the world where they just generally don't give these sort of information out but I wouldn't recommend doing that for white hat hacking primarily because there isn't a need to stay anonymous to that extent what we are going to be using VPNs and proxies mainly for or what they are mainly used for in the world today I would say anyway this is this is just my personal opinion is to bypass firewall settings or firewall limitations should I say so here's a here's a real life example that people have been using quite often that people are using pretty much on a daily basis uh, Netflix for example has a certain range of IP addresses from which it allows connections so if you are elsewhere in the world and you don't you do not belong to that IP address range it will not allow you to view the to view anything on the site it will not allow you to see movies or something of a kind however if you use a proxy a good one or if you use a VPN you will be able to access the site as though you were coming from the country which falls within the IP address range list so that's just one of the common examples of what people are doing not exactly legal but oh well people have been doing it it's not exactly harmful or something like that you're not breaking you're not taking servers down or anything of a kind but people have been using it in order to be able to watch Netflix from I don't know a cell phone when they're traveling or something like that 
In any case, there are numerous other examples uh, when you want to bypass certain firewall settings. Primarily, you bypass the IP range, range lists, which are allowed to access a certain server or something like that. But also, also, for example, if you have a certain server whose traffic is mainly generated from a single area, from a single country, and you do not want to be, for example, scanning it from... I don't know, an IP address that belongs to the area in China or something like that, because those IP addresses, they look they look very differently. I mean, of course, they're written the same, but any network administrator, as soon as they see that IP address of that kind uh, that is far away from their geographical area, they will know that it's an, anon that it's an anomaly of some sort and that it doesn't belong there and they will be intrigued, they will start looking so that is not something you want happening to you. You want to be accessing the server from where, from where all the other users are accessing it from in order to hide yourself in the mass. In any case, that is what we shall be doing in this chapter and a few other things, but for the time being, for this tutorial, I want to show you how you can actually access the dark web or the hidden web, whichever way you wish to refer to it. Now the rumor is that the dark web is a lot bigger than your regular internet. That there is a, that there's a lot more information there and I use its resources. Oh, a lot of people do. There are some very nice forums where you can get a lot of good stuff. So I would definitely recommend trying it out and you will, at some point of time, you will need it. For that you will need to install a Tor browser and with a Tor browser you will be able to access Darknet. Now it is not installed by default on Kali and we do this is one of those rare occasions and rare situations where we will actually need need a different user other than root in order to be able to do anything with Tor in order to be able to start it. So first off I'm going to go ahead and create a new user. So just open up your virtual machine. You see mine is already opened up here. I'm just changing the size so that you can see that it's a virtual machine. And I have my terminal up and running here. I can close it and reopen it. There you go. Just open up your regular terminal and type in the following. So first off, we need Tor. I will explain what Tor is in a moment, but you just type in apt-get space install Tor space dash Y and press enter with this command that I am highlighting at the moment Tor will install no problems on Kali as long as you have an active internet connection. It is, it is not installing here because I already have it installed. The following fact, right, yep there we go. It says Tor is already the newest version. So it is already installed, it is the newest version. I have deliberately skipped all the verbose installation, the entire verbose installation mode primarily because uh, you're not going to see anything useful there at the moment and it's going to waste uh, quite a bit of time. So just type in this command, you will not be prompted for any questions because of the dash y argument and the installation will go through no problems. Let me just go ahead and clear the screen. Now the next thing that we need to do is actually create that user that we have that I have been talking about. So just go ahead and type in the command add user. Uh, just a keynote here. There is also a command user add. Do not use this command for the time being, primarily because I have discovered that it causes some unnecessary complications, which tend to hinder us along the way. So just go ahead and type in add user space and now you can name your user whatever you want. You cannot use capital letters if I remember correctly. That's the rule in Debian systems. So I'm just gonna call my user random. I'm not gonna call him random. I'm gonna call him... how shall I call him? I'll call him test. Here, my user will be test. And there we go. Now it says adding user test, adding new group test, adding new user test with group test. That's pretty much what has happened here. Uh, it has created a home directory for that user. It already exists, what do you know? I have created it previously, but I have deleted it just just to make sure that there are no mistakes in this tutorial, but it doesn't matter. if It, uh, you, it will say here that the home test directory has been created 
and that you will be able to use it. You do need this folder primarily because we're going to be doing stuff there which you cannot do with root. I'll go ahead and type in your password here. It doesn't show anything when you type. That's the standard way of Unix passwords in order to prevent anybody from seeing the length of your password on the screen. Very nice. So press enter. Now you are prompted here for some username uh, information for some information in regards to that user, completely irrelevant for our purpose today. So we do not want to type in the full name, room number, work phone, home phone, other, don't care. Is this information correct? Sure, why not? Press enter, and there we go. We have just effectively created our new user test to which we need to log and then from there conduct our work. Now, a key thing to note here is that even though there is a way of configuring the Tor browser to run as root, it's not simple, but there is a way, uh, do not do that. I mean, do not, primarily, it's not even a good idea to browse the internet as a root user. You can, if you pick any sort of viruses up, any sort of malicious code, it's gonna run as root. So you don't want that on your system. You do not want to compromise it in such a way. And generally on the machine that you are performing these attacks, like this virtual machine of Kali Linux, you don't really use it to browse the internet. For the sake of examples, I, som I sometimes open the, fire the browser Firefox, basically Ice Weasel, and do some stuff there just to show you the information. Or I, as you've seen now, I have downloaded specific from a very specific site actually not now, but in a few moments you will, I will download from a very specific site a Tor browser. So just when you know exactly what you're doing and where you are getting from, getting it from and when you have verification of the source, then you should use it as root or you can use it as root, but otherwise do not browse the internet as a root user. That's a bad idea. However, we will only use this user well, maybe not only, but mainly for our Tor browser. Otherwise, we will be using the root user primarily because you can't do pretty much anything in Kali without the root user. All the tools require, all the tools more or less require these sort of root permissions as they do tend to access network network related things. Anyway, I will cut the tutorial here and I'll see you in the second part of it. Hello everybody and welcome to this tutorial. Today I will be talking about how you can configure proxy chains to work in combination with Tor in order to anonymize traffic, not only web browsing traffic, but rather instead all network related traffic generated by pretty much all of your applications. Now there are there are a few of those which will not work in combination with proxy chains, namely one such application is uh, or piece of software is Metasploit. Now Metasploit is practically a hacking framework and it is of crucial importance for for pretty much any sort of hacking activity in today's world especially because it allows automated generation of code needed to break a certain system and it also contains a list of vulnerabilities as well. However, what I want to do here today is show you how you can anonymize pretty much all footprinting traffic or nmap or traffic generated by nmap when you're gathering information or even your web browsing traffic in a different fashion other than using a Tor browser and how you can cover your tracks in general no matter what you are doing pretty much. So one of the first things uh, that you do need to do uh, in Kali Linux it's, it comes pre-installed so you need Tor and proxy chains uh, these two things you would install on some on some other systems, Linux systems or Windows systems, doesn't matter. Uh, Tor is kind of tricky. I, I have seen versions where Tor is not installed by default. And I have specified in the previous tutorial, I do believe, how to install Tor, no problems. But uh, yeah, what you would need to do here is simply configure and not install anything. So let's just navigate over to the Etsy proxy chains configuration file, nano slash ets, uh, etsy proxy chains dot conf, dot conf. Press enter and there we go. We are in the configuration file. Let me just zoom, let me just expand this actually. And what proxy chains is, 
well it's an abil it gives you an ability to route your traffic through a series of proxy servers and stay anonymous in such a fashion by hiding behind them or by having them forward your requests so that it looks to the other side that your requests are coming from them as opposed to as opposed from you uh, surprisingly enough, there are a large amount of free proxy servers out there that you can use, but they're not very stable. You know, they go up and down and they're not very fast. So for specific targets, they can be useful, not for brute forcing, not for any form of brute forcing attacks. But if you are doing something to a certain target, if you're trying to log in or you're already logged in, you can definitely do it through proxy chains and it will be reasonably fast and reasonably stable as well. But if you're doing some sort of mass scanning or you're brute forcing a password or something of a kind, proxy chains uh, with a list of proxies selected from the internet, free proxies that is, uh, that's not going to work out. Uh, it, it, I mean it's going to work out eventually in a technical sense but it will consume more time than you can spare and by more time than I than you can spare I mean like a month or two to do to do a simple scan so that's not an option there there are other ways of doing that uh, but for the time being I just want to show you how you can use proxy chains how you can configure it actually because it's it's really useful I use it fairly often a lot of people do and it's a fantastic piece of software so first off you have types of proxies here which you can use you have HTTP SOX4 and SOX5 now there are fundamental differences between these protocols uh, you always always want to find yourselves a SOX5 proxy as that is the best possible one that has the ability to anonymize all sorts of traffic HTTP well as the name itself self says it's for HTTP traffic and SOX4 is very similar to SOX5 but it does not support IPv6 protocol and it does not support UDP protocol so this can be the SOX, SOX4 can be rather problematic you always want to make sure that you're using SOX5 wherever and however Anyway, down below you have these options which we will go over. So basically how you enable these options, you don't need to type in some complex lines of code or anything of a kind. Basically just uh, delete the hash and that's it. Save the file, the option is enabled. Ha this hash presents a commented outline, means meaning that the, that the system reading this file will ignore it if there is a hash. If there isn't a hash, it will take it into consideration and interpret it accordingly. Anyway, what we have here are, uh, are statements which allow us to specify how we want our traffic to be routed. So first off, we have dynamic chain. Dynamic chain is some is an option which you will find people using the most it is most commonly used option a preferable one and honestly I think it's the best one primarily because it's the most stable one and here's why suppose you have a B C D proxies so those are some servers with IP addresses with open ports and if you have a strict chain policy like we have here you will only be able to access any site in the on the internet in general uh, by going through A, B, C, D. So you have to go through all of them and you have to go through in that specific order, A, B, C, D. And that's not always a good thing. I mean, if you're paying for five proxies, that's not a problem because they will always be operational. They will always be up and why not? That's a, That's not a bad option there at all. However, most people use free proxies and they don't tend to pay for them. Why would you pay for five, ten proxies uh, for a simple scan or something of a kind? Uh, they're not free. They cost money. They're not that expensive either. But still, I mean, uh, the act of paying itself identifies you and it kind of diminishes the amount of anonymity you have on the net. There are some complex payment methods which you can use to anonymize yourself, but still it's far simpler to simply go ahead and use dynamic proxy chain dynamic chains so without for, I'm just gonna go ahead and uncomment oops and I'm gonna 
uncomment this line go ahead down below and comment this line and comment this line out so strict chains will no longer be used I will be using dynamic chains one more thing to note here is that if you are using if you want to use proxy chains in combination with Tor so if you want to route all of your traffic through the Tor network not just the web traffic uh, you do you must enable dynamic chains I mean there is a chance that it will work with strict chains but due to the instability of Tor nodes uh, it is highly unlikely you will need dynamic chains and that is why I am using them today. Anyway, uh, if you are using dynamic chains it just gives you the ability to go from A, B, C, D to your desired destination by not having to adhere to any order. So let's say that C is down you would go A, B, D and it would work no problems. Even if B was down you would go A, D and you would still reach the destination. So as long as one single proxy is functional it's going to work and you don't require any specific order to it. Down below you have a random chain. Now random chains are in effect uh, basically the same thing as resetting your services. I mean if you're resetting your Tor you will be assigned a new IP address. I mean Tor assigns you a new IP address every 10 minutes or so anyway but the random ch with the random chain you can specify a list of IPs and then you can tell your computer okay I want you to go try I want you to connect to this point and every time you connect every time you transmit a packet I want you to use a different proxy you can do that as well that's one of the options definitely you can say okay use go 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 use this one five times and then change it to another one or something of a kind you, there are a lot of options to specify there uh, primarily the chain length anyway down if we go ahead down below there's the quiet mode you don't really need that proxy DNS requests uh, no leak from DNS data this is very important you cannot have any DNS leaks uh, let me explain to you what DNS leaks are. Even though somebody cannot get your particular IP address, they can get the IP address of the DNS server that you are using. What DNS servers do is resolve doma domains to IP addresses and vice versa. So for example, if you typed in, I don't know, uh, youtube.com, the DNS server of your local ISP provider will resolve that into some sort of an IP address that the YouTube has and it will make a request no problems you do not want that happening because your local DNS server will be discovered and that information can be used in order to figure out your personal IP address and then when that is done your physical location is pretty much compromised so that's that's a no-go you definitely need proxy DNS here it might slow you down a bit but without it you're practically not anonymous it's just a matter of time before somebody finds you if you go down below oops we have some other options here but we're not really interested in them at the moment uh, what we got here are formats for entering proxies and I'm gonna leave it at that and then we'll explain the rest in the follow-up tutorial but just a keynote before we before you before you go into the next tutorial have a look at these you don't need to go on the net or read anything about it just have a look at the format here how how they are written this is an example of proxy chains and how you can write them down and and not, not a bad idea would be to figure out what these last things are here so you have a type of proxy you have an IP address figure out what this number is what this name is and what this word here is I will of course explain all of this in the next tutorial but just try to just try to figure it out on your own and then you'll get the answers it's pretty simple in any case I bid you farewell and I'll see you in the next tutorial Hello everybody and welcome to this tutorial. Today I am going to introduce you to VPNs or virtual private networks and how you can actually connect to them. Now if you go ahead and try to connect as it is, uh, open up your VPN connections here, say configure VPN, you will see that all the options are unavailable. 
you will get an error message saying no VPN plugin available, please install one to enable this button. And that can be problematic, primarily because you, you first need an internet connection in order to install these plugins, and if you are on an unsafe connection or something like that, I would definitely not recommend doing this. Rather, instead, do it from your home connection, install all the plugins, do all the necessary prep work, and then you can connect to and then you can connect to a VPN of your choice through some other network as well. In any case, just go ahead and close this network manager. Let's just go one more time with my mouse over it and it says wired network device not managed. Now this can present a bit of a problem, so let's just go ahead and solve that. It's an easy fix. Sometimes it can be a, pro a connection wise problem that you cannot connect to the internet or something of a kind. In my case it is not, but in your case it might be, so let's just go ahead and fix it. It's an easy fix, no big deal there. Just type in nano slash Etsy network manager with a capital N and again network manager dot conf. So that's the configuration file of our network manager and you see here it says managed equals false. So somewhere it's okay just to use ones and zeros, but I'm not going to take any chances here. I'm just going to type in true, and that's going to be it. Control O to save it. Control X to exit. Is it still? Yep, it's still not managed. That that is because the configuration has not yet been loaded. You need to restart the network manager in order to apply the configuration. So just type in service network. Oops, nope. Network uh, manager restart. Linux is Linux is case sensitive to the point of extreme. I mean, uh, you if you can you can have two same files. So, for example, touch uh, test and test. And if I created these two files, they would be completely different, even though they have exactly the same name, except the first letter is capital letter. Just uh, felt like I should mention that somewhere around here as it can be useful. And there we go. It says wired network if up down ETH zero. Now we are in managed mode. Now the interface is managed and it is fantastic. So this should work now. Let's just go ahead and clear the screen. I have a small leaf pad. A file here. It's a, basically a list of commands for things that you need to install. I figured it, it, I would save some time by just writing them down here and not writing them manually during the tutorial because that would be rather time consuming. So anyway, I'm just going to adapt this because I want to be able to see what is going on when I run these commands. We're going to need a bunch of plugins for our network manager. What we will need is OpenVPN and PPTP, but I'm just going to go ahead and install the rest as well. So let's just add the dash Y uh, so we are not prompted with any questions or anything of a kind, and that should work far better. Dash yes. And I could actually do one more thing. So let's let's see if we can have them all uh, all done in one line. So type in app dash get install, and we can just copy these package names. Actually, the the amount of dash y's that I've passed there is unnecessary, but perhaps if I've done it in a different way, it would make a difference. I can just pass one dash y at the end of this long command because I'm just going to list the packets that I wish to install and it should work, no problems, if I can get around to it. Excellent, so which one, Which what is the last one? Strong, control Z, just bring me back, yep, there we go. And I need network manager VPNC as well, so let's just go ahead and paste that here. And the last one is the GNOME extension, of course, for GUI, so paste it. Pass dash Y at the end, press enter, and there we go. It's going to proceed on with the installation. There's going to be lots of new packets installed, although they're pretty small as there are plugins, so they shouldn't pres so they shouldn't actually take too much of your space on hard disk or anything like that. The amount of space that they do take collectively, all of them is like a couple of megabytes. I think that's it. No, e even if that, if that. The process, the installation process is fairly fast. This will not take a lot of our time, but you see at the end, it's actually, it's well, not at the end, but it is restarting the network manager. However, I will perform a reset in the end. Let's see if I actually need it or did it do it by default. I actually did it by default, which is very nice. So just by stopping and starting the network manager, 
it's actually loading up the new configuration and it seems to be working just fine so we are we do, we no longer need this set of commands as you saw you don't need to actually use every one of these individually you can just use one app get install and then type in the amount of pack all the packets that you wish so let's just go ahead and minimize this as i'm not going to need it now and i can click on add and when i click on add i get a list of possible VPN connections that I can use here and I'm just gonna call the tutorial here because in the next one we have a lot of work to do we need to go onto a website find a suitable VPN and test them out see how good they are see what sort of IP addresses can we actually get from them in any case I bid you farewell and I hope to see you in part two Hello everybody and welcome to this tutorial. Today I will talk about MAC addresses, what they are, uh, how they can be used and how you can change them in order to hide yourself. Well, what is a MAC address? A MAC address is a physical address of pretty much your, not your computer, but rather instead the network interface in your computer, so the network card. All of your network interfaces, they have a MAC address, be it a wireless or a wired interface, regardless, it will have a MAC address burnt into it. And as, as soon as you connect to a wireless network or as soon as you connect to any LAN network with a wired cable or something of a kind, that particular MAC address is used to identify you in combination with an IP address within that LAN network. The MAC addresses do not go further do not go outside the LAN, do not go outside the first jump from the first router. So as soon as you go through the first router from your PC, your MAC address is no longer being shared. Anyway, let's just see how a MAC address looks like. So what, what command do we use if we want to list our network interfaces? Well, you use ifconfig. Oops, sorry, ifconfig, press enter, there we go. So I have a loopback interface, which I'm not really that interested. I just want to remove it for the time being. I have config ETH0. And there we go. So I just wanted a listing for this particular interface. And this is your hardware address. Here it is. Do not confuse it with IPv6 address, which is here. You can see that it is a lot longer and has far more characters. Uh, than a MAC address. MAC address is usually, ha well not usually, but always, and I mean always, the first three sets are used to identify a manufacturer of the device. So the manufacturer is identified by the first three sets, and then the manufacturer assigns other three sets to particular devices as uh, as is decided that you can't really utilize these last three sets because you don't really know what the manufacturer has done with them. But you can use the first three sets in order to figure out who the who has produced the device. And if you know which company has made it has made the device, then you can know the possible vulnerabilities of that device. This is also one of the methods of footprinting, of figuring out a MAC address of a device. And if you have a MAC address, you can conclude with reasonable safety who the device belongs to, not who the device belongs to, but who has produced it. And in doing so, you will get a better idea of what you can do with the, what you can do with the, with the device, how you can exploit it, and so on. Now let's just uh, have a look at it a bit closer. I have config. You can also do this. So let me just give an example of a grep command. You can use pipe grep and you can type in this h h w a oops h w a d d r and there you go. This is a far better listing. So it will list eth link ethernet and h w a d d r so you can see clearly what is written here there are there are methods i can you i can filter this through awk awk and then just remove this and this and leave only this to be printed out but here you just have a better overview of the mac address this is how you can get it in a bit of a better way now keep in mind that this hw addr can also be a lot of things can be written here that depends from one system to another but it is irrelevant you can always view it through using an if config if config command and then you, when you know how mac addresses are written when you know their formats uh, you can always recognize them even in the vast mass of information. I'll just go ahead and clear the screen. 
Since MAC addresses are used to identify you on a wireless network, you should definitely, I mean, they will identify the device, but nobody will know who is using the device. However, uh, you know, if somebody actually bothers to check the devices within the network, they will know who you are, they will be able to kick you off the network, and that's not a good idea. That's not what we want. We want to be anonymous and we want to hide. Uh, one of the downsides of MAC addresses and them being used as means of identification is that if you can view the other MAC addresses on the same network in LAN and then you can copy those MAC addresses, use them as your own, do some sort of shenanigans on the network, admins will notice that there is a problem, they will permanently ban that MAC address, and there you go, you have successfully DDoS the person you wanted to DDoS. I have seen this used in class so many times. Basically what people would do is figure out what the professor's laptop MAC address is, and then they would, then they would deliberately use malicious activity on the net, just try logging into a router a couple of times, the administrators would notice and they would permanently ban that Mac, MAC address, effectively rendering that laptop useless for that lecture because that laptop could no longer connect to the wireless projectors where the presentations were being held. So that's, that's a bit of a downside of it all. Uh, they eventually did get caught and it was a pretty pretty messy situation, but I'm just giving you an example of how these things can be used and abused as well. Not suggesting that you should do something of a kind, use it for a benevolent purpose, use it to make money, uh, to, to, to advance your career and something like that. Don't use it for silly things such as these because you literally have no gain, no benefit, nothing. You can only cause yourselves harm in such a way. Anyway, without further ado, you can use a tool called Mac Changer. So Mac changer, press enter, and there you go. You see it is installed here and it gives you certain, I have given it no parameters, nothing like that. So it says usage, Mac changer, option, and then device. But I don't want that. I want to use the help op help bar and I'm just going to clear this, Mac changer dash dash help. Let's see what we have here. So you have a few options, not that many. It's a fairly simple tool, easy enough to use. You have this one to print the help print the version and exit, uh, print the MAC address. You can also view a MAC address with this. I didn't know that, actually. Let's give, let's give it a try. MAC changer. I didn't know it because I never bothered to check it in such a way. I always used ifconfig. Wait, is it S show ETH0? Huh, well, what do you know? It does actually work. So it says permanent MAC address. This is its permanent MAC address. This is its manufacturer who owns this the first three sets of the MAC address and then you have the current MAC address which we can with which we can do whatever we want. So let's just go ahead and clear this clear the screen for convenience sake and call the help menu once more. So this is one more way to check the MAC address and exit. This this you can use actually to verify things. I usually just go and use ifconfig but this is also a very nice thing to do. Uh, now, this is what I was talking a moment ago. It says, do not change vendor bytes. So if you want to, if you want to become, if you want to change your MAC address, but still stay within the same vendor, uh, it says, don't change the vendor bytes. So those are the first six ones, the first three sets, that is. Set a random vendor MAC of the same kind. You can also use those parameters. These parameters are not used that often. Usually what you would use is either a fully random MAC address or you would use it of a particular vendor. So you would go online, see what the particular vendor uh, I, uh, MAC addresses are or you can print known vendors. So you got list, let me just show you, dash L and there are a lot of them. So it is only showing you the first three sets and then for the other three you can type in whatever you feel like typing in. It doesn't even matter if you want to be, yeah, that if you, but people don't generally do this. I mean, unless there is some sort of specific thing where you want to hide in the network and pass off as a, you see, it says Balkan, this is a router, so Cisco routers, 
So if you want to pass on a network as a, as a standardized device within that network and not raise any suspicions, suspicions, this is a good way of doing it, actually, because you can have the MAC address of a device, and if an administrator takes a look, it, he's going to see, oh, it's, this is one of my routers, but it, well, what do you suppose that's doing here, or something of a kind. Uh, but he won't be able to figure it out until he actually digs deeper. The important thing here is that if anybody digs deep enough, surely enough, they will find that you are doing, that you, they will figure out that you are doing something. But the idea is not to raise any flags, any suspicion, and in such a way pass off unnoticed. So once again, call the help menu. And you, of course, have an ability to cause a fully random MAC address. And this is what I was talking about. See here, you use the M parameter or dash dash MAC and then you type in the MAC address that you want and this is what people were using. They were using the MAC addresses of legit devices on the network, conduct malicious activity and then those devices would be banned. So that's a pretty that's a pretty big problem that people were causing. So let me just show you what I mean by uh, let me just show you how the changing of a MAC address looks like. We will deal with this sort of an attack a bit later on when we get into wireless when we get into wireless hacking and breaking wireless encryptions and what you can do on a wireless LAN network. But here, I just want to show you how a changed, a changed MAC address looks like. So let's just just show ETH, oops, ETH zero. Okay, so we've seen this a moment ago. Now here's what happens when I use MAC changer. MAC change, MAC changer uh, dash random ETH zero press enter and there we go it says permanent current new so this is the new MAC address and it says unknown I haven't assigned it to any particular vendor or anything of a kind and if I now say show excellent so it says permanent and current so this is the the current one is the one that is being shown that can be seen within the LAN network and that is used to identify you even though you can't actually destroy your own MAC address because it's literally burnt in. Uh, this one will be shared with everybody else and this one will remain within within your own computer. It will not go through it will not exit your interface under any circumstances. Anyway, uh, good practice would be to always to set up a script which on boot time changes the MAC address and sets it to random every time you boot your computer. So that's not a bad idea either. So when you, if you are doing something and you forget to change the MAC address on LAN or something like that, it can be problematic. So not a, a good idea would be to set up an automatic MAC changing. So nothing really special there. You don't need to do any particular particularly difficult tasks. I will show this in the next tutorial, in the follow-up one. But until then, I hope that you have enjoyed the tutorial and thank you for watching. Hello everybody and welcome to this tutorial. Today I will start a chapter on footprinting. So I have explained what the act of footprinting is before, but now we will actually go ahead and conduct a few scans to see how it all works and introduce you to the tools that we will be using. So first off, we need to find ourselves a target to scan. Of course, I could just scan myself or something of a kind, but that would not be a realistic thing really because I already know what's I already know what the results are going to be and plus on top of that, I'm not scanning long range over the internet or something of a kind. I would be scanning within my own local network, so it, the speeds of the scan would not be realistic as it would be a lot faster than for than say when you conduct a scan over the net, some distant and remote server. So what I did was I went online, and you can do the same, and I found on the official Nmap, on the official Nmap website, they have a section devoted to actually allowing people to scan them to test their tool out. Now here is the, I'm selecting the permission. You, there is a written permission here that you can actually scan this website and they basically say I mean you can scan it to test it out a few scans a day here is fine but 
do not scan a hundred times a day or use this to test your SSH brute force password cracking tools etc. So that's definitely something you don't want to do but you can run a few scans on this site uh, per day and according to them that's perfectly fine. It's You are not breaking any laws or anything of a kind. I'm just emphasizing one more time that you do have a written permission right here on the site, which is fantastic because it gives us an opportunity to actually simulate real-time circumstances and see how Nmap behaves. Now, Nmap is an unescapable tool of pretty much any pen tester out there. You, many people say today, well, that it's pointless to port scan doesn't do you much good and so on and so forth. Well, perhaps in terms of exploiting uh, the services running on the ports themselves, it doesn't do you that much good, but just by seeing which ports are open and which ports are closed, you can, to a fairly good extent, determine what operating system or what platform is being used on the other side. And then you can find weaknesses of that same platform. Of course, there are some other ways of doing this. I will show them to you, like banner grabbing or something of a kind. But let's just see how Nmap really works. Now, Nmap is known to basically uh, trigger quite a, quite a lot of alarms, quite a, a lot of firewall red flags, so to say. And you want to make sure that your Nmap scans are as quiet as possible. Now there are tools to actually figure this one to actually figure this out, but I will show you here uh, how to actually do it via terminal. There is also something called ZenMap. Now ZenMap is basically a graphical user interface of Nmap, but we will not be using that. Rather, instead, I want to teach you how to use a terminal version. So Nmap is the one most commonly used, and it is always used in the terminal text format. Rarely anybody uses the actual graphical user interface. In the previous chapter, we have also discussed how to stay anonymous. So at the end of this chapter, I will be combining these things. Uh, scan footprinting and the act of scanning and anonymizing your scans. However, you might think about that before you get to the final tutorial of this chapter and perhaps try to do it yourselves. It doesn't matter if you fail or something of a kind. It truly doesn't. What is important is that you give it a shot and you try it once, okay, fi failure, fine, no problems. Try it twice, thrice. The fourth time, you're bound to have some sort of results. As long as you keep improving yourselves, it's fine. In any case, without further ado, adieu, let's just type in, let's just mean just nmap, nmap, dash, dash, help. Oops, I mistyped that, of course. nmap, press enter, and there we go. There are a lot of options here. I mean, a Download of options, way more options than we actually need for some sort of basic things. However, uh, eventually over time you will come to understand that all of these options are not here for nothing. They are here uh, because they are they were needed at some point of time, and they are pretty much all still used. So what you need to do is scroll down to the bottom. And here you have examples of how Nmap runs. So you type in Nmap, dash V, almost always, 99% of times, 99% of time is verbose output. It's basically, you're telling your system to give you more information in regards to what it is doing. Uh, dash A, I'm not sure where this function is. Oh, okay, here it is. Dash A, enable OS detection, version detection, script scanning, and trace route. I uh, don't think we're going to need that immediately. There is one, there is dash O function, which is just for OS detection. Anyway, and then you can pass either this one, you see scanme.nmap.org, which is basically the domain name, which will get resolved to an IP address, or you can actually pass it an IP address. And if you're wondering what this is, this is a mask. And it, it would be very difficult to explain in great detail what this is, but for the time being, know that this is actually an IP address range. So it goes from a certain IP address to a certain IP address because this goes way into networking and binary numbers and so on and so forth. But you do not actually need to use this format. Not that many people actually use this particular format with the mask. 
they just tend to specify very specific ranges because they don't have they usually don't have the permissions to scan the entire subnet rather instead they have to they have to create lists and then skip certain IP addresses and then continue again from a certain point so you do need they do need to create lists and that can be a problem now up here you at the top you have another very important option that's going to come in handy you have dash il input file name so you can actually create a list or in a file a list of IP addresses and then you can scan those particular IP addresses there is also and they will also have an ability to do this look at what's what's written here so just take a look at this segment and it's 10 0 and then this segment here this octet here it's 0 to 255 and then the last octet is 1 to 255 if you're wondering why i'm calling these uh, these things octets it's because they have it's because they have 8 bits each one of these has 8 bits and it is represented in a binary form so it, it can have uh, eight zeros or I don't know eight ones or a combination of ones and zeros but it has eight bits so eight positions that's why they're called octets this is a very common form that people tend to use and this is what you will find your cells using either this this will be a method in which you will specify the IP addresses or you will be passing uh, files so these files usually people well they either make them make them themselves or they can find these IP addresses on the internet so in addition to this site nmap.org you also have this one here major IP blocks let me just see if I've typed in that correctly and this is a fan yep there it is okay so this is a fantastic website uh, the entire range of pretty much all the IP addresses are listed here and it also says who owns what it doesn't say for every one of them who owns which one but for example you can search and find and it's gonna give you the the appropriate IP addresses for that particular country and it's gonna give you the owner of those IP addresses usually it's just telecoms but you also have other people who own them as well so let's just let's just give it a shot uh, search I don't know let's just type in Germany or I don't know France whatever okay this is not the proper search but no that not a problem actually you can find it down here and I'm not gonna type it in here or I could control F France there we go down here just saving myself a bit of time there and there we go so uh, you have a range this is a given range here it's from 2000 to 215 255 255 this is a massive range this is a humongous range look at how many this is how many IP addresses you can have in total how many of them you can generate within this range so it's quite a lot it's French telecom I don't know for some reason they need it so you can sort them out by the owner and you can see that a lot of them are actually not listed here Wow, France has like a lot of IP addresses assigned to it they're not free they cost money let's just go ahead and see down down below where is it where is it okay so you see all of these IP addresses and this is a pretty massive range so this is a telecom in French in, in France sorry not in French in France look at how many IP addresses IP addresses ranges that they have so that's quite a lot and this site as I said previously you can use to figure out which IP address range do you wish to scan but you usually do not have the permission to scan the entire range you can scan certain IP addresses within that range for which you have a permission but also a very nice site to determine where the IP address is from or something like that however always remember once you get an IP address uh, your search engines on the net are your best friends this is one of major major exp I mean major components of footprinting you can do the following you can type in who 
space is and then type in an IP address. I don't know, I'm just going to type in this random IP address. So if you don't want to see it here, you can have a look at it here. Oops. Who is? And I don't know, somebody's going to tell me who this guy is or to whom does this... There we go. So I've typed in who is and I've picked the first website out that I could find and here I have all the information in regards to that particular IP address. I have a country, I have I have the username of the admin I suppose, I have the status, remarks, source, I even have a... yep there we go, there's actually an address, a physical address of the IP address which is ridiculous. Uh, yeah, so as I said, search engines are your best, and I mean absolutely best friends. If you want to find pretty much anything on the net or something like that in regards to an IP address to do any sort of research. So those are the two tools that I have showed you, actually three of them, well one tool and two websites that you can use. The, one tool, one website, and one search method, which you can use in order to determine where the IP address is from, or who is using it, and even to determine its physical location. Although its physical location can be assigned to a telecom, and that telecom can assign it to a city, and to, to a specific region in the city, or something of a kind, and then you can find it on Google Ma on Google Earth or something of a kind, but usually those things are not that precise. What is precise, however, is that the IP address belongs to a telecom or something of a kind, and they keep rotating them in between the cities, so if you have, let's say, 100,000 IP addresses that you've scanned, and if you wish to sort them out by the city, you will get like 70 to 90 percent accuracy depending on which for which country did you do it can be problematic because you're going to miss out on some things, but if you don't need 100% accuracy, you can get your sorting done pretty well. There are databases which you can update. I will show you these things. It's geo, it's, they're called GeoIP lookups. But before we do that, you also have something called NS lookup, up, NS lookup, and I'm just going to use this generic name here, scanme.nmap.org. Let's paste it. And there we go. I have basically said I want I want to look up this I want to look up files on scanme.nmap.org. And okay, this is my DNS server, which is basically my router. You see it says port 53, you know immediately that it's a uh, you know immediately that it's DNS because all DNS traffic runs on port 53. And then we have the results. So th this is the domain name and you get the IP address down below. So this is also one of the ways in which we can get the IP address of a domain, of a site with a domain because once you know the domain you don't actually know the IP address until you look it up or something like that. But there's a far simpler method. You don't need to use NSLOOKUP. Oh, by the way, NSLOOKUP also works in reverse. So just type in NSLOOKUP and you can type in the IP address. So I'll just go ahead and press enter. Okay, so this has run through a process of some sort down below. These are authoritative answers from the, it says name servers, basically what that means, they are DNS servers and they are giving you responses and telling you to whom the domain belongs to and so on and so forth. But look, uh, ignore this part and for the time being, we can also ignore this part until we get into DNS, into into spoofing the DNS and changing it and so on and so forth. What I want to show you here is that you can actually get a domain name by typing in NS lookup and then the IP address and here where it says non-authoritative answer, you get the IP address and then you get the name, which is the domain name. However, you might notice that there was a problem here, that this IP address does not match this one. Well, guess what? It actually does. Uh, try looking at in reverse. So it's 74, 74 here, 207, 207 here, 244, 244 here, and 221 here, and 221 here. So when you do an NS lookup, and when you pass in an IP address, uh, it's going to do a re reverse lookup. 
in the DNS MX records or something of a kind. It, it's going to it's going to query the DNS servers and the DNS servers are going to give it a response. But in the MX records, this is basically how things are written. You write an IP address in reverse and then you put this in dash ADDR dot RPOP. But this part really is not that interesting to us. This is more interesting to server admins who configure the DNS servers or something of a kind. In any case, for the time being, but don't worry, we will get to DNS DNS servers in the later stages of this tutorial once we are done with these things. In any case, what is important for you here is you've typed in an IP address, you've used a tool called NSLOOKUP, and you have gotten a domain name in return. And now you can start doing some other things as well, but we will be dealing primarily with Nmap, Nmap as a tool in order to scan networks and to retrieve information from them. But this what I've showed you now is some basic information retrieval and some basic external sources that you can use. In any case, I'll see you in the second in this in part two or the second tutorial of Nmap introduction and there we're gonna actually conduct some scans and see how it all works. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you next time. Hello everybody and welcome to this tutorial. Today I will begin a chapter on wireless hacking. So first off you need to know that there are different types of encryption. There is there is VEP or WEP and whoever still is using WEP doesn't really deserve to have wireless just saying <laughs> primarily because it's practically as if you had a free password or an open Wi-Fi. It doesn't really matter, it's quite easy to crack, no problems, 3, 2, 1. However, uh, if you're using VPA or VPA2, that is another story that's quite difficult to crack, especially if the passwords are longer or something of a kind. There are different methods uh, for direct wireless hacking, and I really would not recommend I really would not recommend them in all circumstances. There are some circumstances which are favorable to these sort of methods. However, what is always better is to actually uh, get an IP of the router and then attack the router itself because usually it has far more vulnerabilities than the VPA2 encryption that you are trying to crack. However, since we are cracking wireless, I'm just going to go ahead and type in IF, con oops, IF config here and you will notice that I don't have a wireless interface here. Why is that? Well, even though I have a network integrated card, wireless one, within my laptop, this is a virtual machine and virtual machines do not support integrated network cards. They can only go through your main through your host machine and in such a way virtual virtual machines are secure so you can install all sorts of stuff on them viruses etc and you'll still be safe they won't be infecting you and they won't be able to disrupt the normal functioning of your uh, host machine however there are methods where you can get a usb uh, wireless card and plug it in and you can set up a pass through for your wireless machine and in such a way gain access to wireless however Password cracking from a virtual machine is not a good idea. I mean, it's a terrible idea, especially using VirtualBox. Maybe if you were using Xen or something of a kind where you have 90 to 95 uh, native performance, that'd be great. But using VirtualBox for password cracking, that is a really bad idea, primarily because, uh, let me just show you here. If you go up, if you go device devices, and I can click, on, sure, why not? I'm just going to go ahead and click on network settings and then I will get the menu for the other things. So let's just go ahead and click on general. Is it here? No, system, sorry. Look, first of all, it has base memory. This can be altered when the machine is off. You cannot change the settings here while the machine is turned on. First of all, it says that I have two gigs of RAM available for this particular virtual machine. Now that's great for day-to-day -day operations, especially for Linux that requires 512 megabytes to run. However, if you want to crack, if you want to brute force a password, uh, if you want to take that path, if you want to use a brute force method, 
just by generating huge password lists and trying to guess it. This is not really a good amount of RAM. Actually, this is a terrible amount of RAM for such a task. And if we go ahead and click on the processor, you will see that, okay, execution cap is 100%, but we only have a single core assigned. It says here one CPU core in the upper bar, in the upper status bar. It says processors. It's gray at the moment because you can't change the amount of processors that a machine is using the, uh, while it's running. So that 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 makes no sense of whatsoever. You wouldn't be able to do that in the real world either. Maybe on some large servers or something like that. But even they're very doubtful that you can actually swap a processor. That's mainly for swapping disks or adding RAM or something of a kind. In any case, uh, it has only one CPU assigned to it. I know it says here four, but I have an Intel i7 inside and uh, the virtual box supports only four, four CPU cores for its machines. And it is taken, take it, take it into consideration. You should take into consideration that you really won't need more than four uh, for your virtual machines, especially if you're performing some testing tasks or I don't know, even if you're programming, unless you're doing something specific that has, that is strongly related to graphics, you won't be needing that many cores or anything of a kind. One CPU is perfect. That's fine. You won't need any more. So anyway, I'm just going to go ahead and click. Oh, wait, acceleration. Yep, never mind. I'm going to click OK here. And I just wanted to show you that in order to demonstrate that the resources of your virtual machine are simply not sufficient in order to support a brute force method. Uh, as I said, you can actually buy for about 20 bucks somewhere in the store a, net, a network card, a USB network card with wireless one. Plug it in, pass through the ports, and it's going to work, but it's going to be terribly slow. What you need to do is either set up a dual boot, or if you are running a Linux machine as your host machine, you can do what I, what I will do now. Let me just move away from this. Excellent. So because my main machine is Fedora Linux, I have installed all the necessary tools on it. Pretty much this, you can install the same tools on Fedora as you can on Kali. And I will be doing my pen testing from here, from Fedora. I will exit the virtual machine. I will no longer use Kali for this purpose. However, if you are a Windows user, if you don't have a native Linux system as your host machine, you will also be able to do this in Windows. I will show you the installation process alone. I will not show the actual method, but principles are the same. Primarily because when you do it in Windows, you have to use the GUI mode. And quite frankly, for these sort of things, I personally do not like to do them via GUI. It's far more effective to do them from the terminal. So some of the tools that we will need, I will just mention them here and Feel free to read up on them a little bit in the net as you progress through the course and then and then uh, go through the videos as well. So there's a lot of extra information out there on the net, especially if you're facing some sort of bugs or something of a kind. Uh, also feel free to post it in the question section. If something is not working, I will be more than happy to try to fix it for you. So just type in uh, yum search. Oops, sorry, yum search. This is one of the tools that we will need. Air crack dash ng. Press enter and it should find it shortly. There we go. Uh, Air crack is in the default repositories of Fedora and you will be able to find it there without any sort of problem. So it says air crack dash ng x86 64. This is a standard for wireless and it says sniffer v v vep and vpa psk key cracker. We're interested in this part, key cracker. Basically, you can install it anywhere. We can even install it on the virtual machine, capture the file on the host machine, transfer transfer the file there, but there really is no point to do that. Now, we will install it, and I will teach you how to use it. There are lots more things related to aircrack, but there is one more, there is one more uh, tool that we will use that employs a completely different method, uses a completely different way of cracking wireless passwords. 
and we'll mainly be talking about VPA and VPA2 passwords, encryption methods. I will do a brief demonstration of how to do how to crack the WEP, but I mean chances of you encountering WEP in today's world are practically non-existent. I mean, if just you uh, open up your cell phone, uh, I don't know if you're using Android or uh, Apple's phones or whatever, whatever or Windows phones and whatever else is out there. Just take a look at the wireless networks around you and take a look at the encryption methods because they will be shown to you. You will almost never and see VEP. If you ever do see it, it's practically open Wi-Fi because web has been cracked. It takes a very short amount of time to break it without any sort of problems. You don't need to you don't need to use any sophisticated methods of any kind or sort. A child could crack it without any problems, basically just follow through the procedure and that's it. Now, as I was saying, there is another method of doing this for VPA and the tool name is Reaver. Reaver. Now, Reaver is not in Fedora's default repository, so we will need to go through the installation process in order and find it on the net. But basically what Reaver does is guesses the pins on your router. So most routers these days have pin authentication whereby you press a button and everybody around and everybody around you can connect to that to that router basically. Uh, these things have been invented primarily for win Windows users. Uh, rarely, very rarely will you find a Linux with support for pins primarily because the method is highly insecure. I mean that is really one of the downsides of wireless if you're using pin authentication you should definitely disable it on your home routers as it enables malicious attackers to basically uh, take your Wi-Fi get your IP address and from there move on to more serious things I will show you how to disable these things as well on one of my routers that I have here uh, I think I have a TP link or something like that I will plug it in later on and show it to you what it does but in any case as a part of the air crack package you will get a few other programs which we will use and later on there is one in air crack package uh, one program in air crack package that enables you to perform a DOS attack on wireless networks around you so you will be able to pretty much de authenticate whoever you want whenever you want as long as two conditions are met the first condition is proximity, that you are close enough to the network. And the second condition is that you actually have to scan in monitor mode with your network card and figure out what is going on around you, what are the what what is the MAC address of that access point and what is the MAC address of the person you want to jam. This is not that difficult to do. This is easy. Uh, both MAC addresses are public information pretty much all you need to do is listen for them. And that is what monitor mode is. Basically, network cards have a lot of modes that they can operate in. And, well, maybe not, a lot, maybe not a lot. I think it was six or something like that. But there are only two which are of interest to us. There is the promiscuous mode where you get, where your network card will only process traffic that is meant exclusively for it, regardless of, I don't know, capturing some other traffic that is being transmitted wirelessly through the air. I mean, just think about it. You have so many wireless access points around you and they are all communicating with devices and it's not like that wireless access point can send a signal in a specific direction to your device. No, it sends it in a spherical fashion and your device catches it. A lot of other devices catch it, but since the information is encrypted and since the information is not for them, uh, they immediately figure out that it's not for them, namely your network cards figure it out and they immediately disregard the information, they don't do anything with it. However, if you put your network cards into monitor mode, they will actually take all of this traffic, process it and see what they can get from it. Some of it is encrypted, most of it is encrypted, but some of it isn't, like the MAC addresses which can't be encrypted and that's the, that's the bright side of it all. You can take it and you can jam whoever you want you can deny wireless access to pretty much every to everybody within range with just having your laptop and no extra devices are needed this is all pure software you don't need any extra devices 
Of course, it is necessary that your network card supports monitor mode. I will. Sh there is a compatibility list on the net. I will show it to you uh, in the follow-up tutorial. But for the time being, I just wanted to introduce you to the chapter and to see what we shall be doing. So before you, uh, I would advise, you don't have to, of course, and you will be able to fully follow through the next tutorial without doing this. But I would just advise typing aircrack-ng on Google or your whatever your favorite search engine is and type in reverb. Just read the first post, read the first couple of sentences of the first post that comes by and see if you can collect some information there. Then you can continue on watching the next video where I will show you how to install these things. I will show you how to install aircrack-ng on Windows and I will attempt a reaver as well but sometimes reaver tends to break on Windows and that can be problematic but primarily I will show you how to install aircrack-ng. I'll show you how to use it there a bit. It's not that hard. There's a graphical interface practically. You can just click through it no problems. However, I restate once again that you do that you should have a Linux host machine which you can use to which you have access primarily because a lot of these tools are a lot faster on Linux machines they work much better they're faster and quite frankly they are easier to install plus you get a higher degree of anonymity anyway I bid you all farewell and I'll see you in the follow-up tutorial Hello everybody and welcome to this tutorial. Today I will show you how you can install Aircrack and Reaver. So Aircrack is pretty simple. Just type in yum install aircrack-ng and it's going to pick up the right version by default so just go ahead and press enter. Uh, in Fedora it runs through checks every time you call yum you can pass a dash c argument in order not to do that. It says package aircrack-ng is already installed and latest version. But if you you might be prompted for a question along the way if you want to skip that just go ahead and type in dash y that's it with this command that I am selecting at the moment installation will fly through you won't be prompted for any questions and you will have aircrack-ng installed on your system without any problems. However uh, Reaver is quite a different story. Reaver cannot be found in Fedora's repositories and therefore it has to be downloaded from the net. Now the, there are lots of places to do this. I have chosen to download it from Google Code. That's basically the safest place from where you can download it. And let's just go ahead open up my favorite browser which is Firefox. You can open whatever you wish. Type in Reaver Google Code should uh, should pop up yep this is it there we go now we are on Google code website where we have Reaver VPS you have a description here and you have a pro version here basically the difference between the pro version and uh, the one that we're getting for free is this graphical user interface which I mean let's face it if you're a pen tester uh, you or a white hat hacker, you're not going to be using that much of a GUI. I mean, pretty much not at all. Optimized pin sequencing, this just means that it's uh, going to try pins in a certain order, which is more likely to succeed than the default one, according to someone, but not necessarily true. And integrated uh, WEP cracking, and as I said, you don't really need WEP. You're not going to be able to find it these days pretty much anywhere. If you do, as I said before, those people don't deserve to have Wi-Fi. It's basically fr it's basically open Wi-Fi regardless of what sort of a password you put in. Make sure you do, you're you not one of those people. Uh, I mean, fine, okay, somebody's going to connect, be able to connect to your network and all that. But it opens up a route for a lot for a lot worse activity for something more malicious. Let's put it so uh, they'll be able to reroute your traffic and do stuff of a kind and sniff it. Not a good idea. Just switch to VP VPA or VPA two. Anyway, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and click on downloads in the upper left corner. 
and there are there are different versions here that can be downloaded i mean it, there are some there are bug fixes that, there are no fundamental differences in the way that Reaver works in between these versions, but there are bug fixes definitely, and that is very nice. It is maintained, uh, the package, there's support for it, and so on. So just go ahead and click on Reaver 1.4.tar.gz, and it says uh, Reaver.tar.gz here, file description, etc. This is a checksum. You can use this in order to verify is your file intact, but I'm not going to do that now. I'm just going to go ahead and download it. So once it is downloaded, uh, you can go ahead and open up the folder in which it actually exists. And I have a lot of things here. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Here we go. So it says I have different versions that I have downloaded from different sites. But if you find this package that I am selecting for you at the moment, it says Reaver 1.4 FC20. The letters are pretty small, and this is maximum that I can zoom it in. Uh, don't download it. it. It doesn't work that well at all. Uh, it tends to break, and the .rpm extension doesn't work quite as you would expect it to work. Just download it from Google Code and compile it from source. There's no reason why not to do it, especially when you have me showing you in detail how to do it. So Just go ahead and double click on this file. You can extract it with a through a GUI method. It's far simpler. You can also extract it through the, ter through the terminal, but I'm just going to go ahead and use GUI for this occasion. Uh, this is one of the advantages of Linux over Windows. By default, it will be able to unpack pretty much anything. Zip, tar, uh, WinRAR, whatever, it's going to be able to unpack it. No problems, which is fantastic. No, no extra installation needed. This is all installed by default. So let's just go ahead and ex click on Extract. Now, where do I want to extract? Let's say to desktop because I'm going to delete it anyway, uh, as I already do have it installed. So just go ahead and press OK. And right. No, no, no. Give me desktop. Sorry for this. OK. And yeah, I've, I've just issued a. Just told it to do it twice. Oh well. Apply to all. Overwrite. We're not going to lose a lot of time there as the extraction process is relatively fast. Okay, so let's just go ahead, open up back, go back to our terminal, navigate over to desktop. Oops. Desktop. And I got, I imagine I have a lot of things there. Nope, it's not this one. Okay, so CD home chronic desktop, enter. LS and do I have it here? Do, 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 do. Yep, there we go. So clear. Oops, clear. Let me just show you that I do in fact have it. Hello. It's much neater if I do it like this. And there we go. Reaver 1.4. Let's navigate over to that folder. Reaver 1.4. Clear the screen. Cl clear the screen. List the contents of the directory. Go to docs first let's just go ahead and see what is there and like you might think that I am some sort of an expert or something of a kind and then I that I just do these things out of my head no uh, people create readme files for a reason they are there to be read because the developer has left specific instructions on how to do something so let's just go ahead and and cat it Excellent. So the following are Reaver source files. So it has the description of what is located in each one of these files. So you have 802.11.c, functions for reading, sending, and phrasing, 802.11 management frames. 802.11 is a standard, as I said before. But look at this. Look at this. Uh, the developer has actually, well, these are all useless things for the time being, but the devel developer has actually left the entire installation process here. Uh, you have every single command that you need to run explained in detail what it does and how you can type it in and execute it. This is wonderful and that is why I say when, when you download something 
when you unzip it, uh, just go ahead and find the readme file. It's there for a reason. Uh, people do do tend to leave instructions there on how to do something, and they've most likely encountered the same problems that you might have encountered. So you can even see possible solutions. Anyway, uh, check uh, you can check this inscription out. Oh, not an inscription, but the text. River is only supported and only supported on Linux platforms. Requires libcap this li this lib sql sql i3 uh and one more can't really pronounce this and can be built and installed by running the following commands so execute the configuration script make make install that's it and it even tells you uh how to actually uninstall it so they're there for a reason. Anyway, ls, of course you cannot run the configuration file from here, you need to reverse course and go to source from, yep, src, src, let's see what is in there, there we go, we have configure, configure. and you can see by default here it's executable, if I just give you a longer listing, configure there you go it has it has an X permission here here and here so the user has it the group has it as well anyway type in dot slash conf uh, sorry configure so now it's checking for stuff it needs it it has its dependencies without which it cannot function type in make up oh, there we go it's running through so I didn't I didn't do anything out of my head here I just uh, went on the web I found the safest place I can find to download the code from and I'm compiling it here as the creator as the developer of the code instructed me to do it and the instructions aren't that complicated just three commands and the final command is make install Now it's going to give me a lot of errors here. Well, not errors, but warnings primarily, because I already have I already have it installed. And see here it says RM. I need to I need to clear this out, and then be able to install this. But that's not that's not going to happen primarily because I do have Reaver installed. So let's just go ahead. Let's just go ahead and check one more time if there's anything else that we've left out, if I can reach it. Uh, down below, yep, there we go. So no, I haven't left anything out. Basically, the last command for you will run. For me, it won't, primarily because I, have, I already have Reaver installed on my system. If there are any problems, feel free to post it in the question section. I will be more than happy to help you out. Let's just go ahead and clear this out. Let's test it. Let's see. So type in reaver dash dash help. Excellent. It is installed. It is functional. It is responsive to our commands. And here is the syntax for reaver. It's, this is the basic syntax. Of course, you can pass all of these arguments to it. And there are quite a lot of them. Basically, what you say is dash i for network interface and dash b for BSSID or for the MAC address, simpler put put quite simply. For the MAC address, here you have it. This is just a sample MAC address that has been generically placed here. And of course, we have even for Reaver dash v v for double verbose output, which is fantastic. Let's just go ahead and clear the screen. That was uh, that was a way in which you could have installed Aircrack and Reaver in Linux. But just in case uh, you are a Windows user, I'll show you how to do it in Windows. Until then, I bid you farewell. Hello everybody and welcome to this tutorial. Today I will show you how you can actually crack a Wi-Fi. Today we will actually get into it now that all the prep work is done now that we have all the tools installed and our system set up. The first thing that we will need to do is uh, set, set our network wireless card into monitor mode. Type in ifconfig, press enter, 
and this option will display all the network interfaces that are available. My wireless interface is called VLP2S0. A bit of a strange name, I know, but Fedora has a custom for giving strange names, like my wired connection is called P8P1, which is kind of weird, but okay, never mind. Just see which one's your is and how is it called and adapt accordingly. Anyway, I'm going to use VLP2S0. In order for me to configure it to function in monitor mode, uh, there are two ways. So the first one, the first one is what I usually use to set it in monitor mode, and the second one is what I usually use to actually check if there are any problems of whatsoever. So go ahead and type in IV, nope, IF config again, VLP2S0, which is the name of my wireless network, which is the name of my wireless network card and type in down let's bring let's shut our wireless card down completely let's turn it off and now we can do some modifications to it type in iv config vlp2s0 mode monitor moni monitor again i have config vlp2s0 up and now our network card is configured to function in monitor mode while on the other hand, while before this it was functioning in the promiscuous mode, there are several names for it, but promiscuous mode is the most common. And the difference between the two operating modes is that one mode allow. And there you go. I have my wireless connection deactivated in the upper right corner. The difference between the two modes is that in one mode wireless cards are or general network cards are configured to accept all packages regardless whether they are meant for them or not and in promiscuous mode they will only accept packages that are meant specifically for them. Now I'm going to go ahead and clear the screen and I will finally start using uh, some of the software packages that are that come with Aircrack. I have a list of commands here for you which we will use today on my right side and we're going to use a few few other ones but these are the basic ones these are the ones that you absolutely need to know so let me just go ahead and type in airmon dash ng vl oops check vlp2s0 i want to see if there are any uh, possible processes that could cause problems that would cause interference and i see that there are quite a bit of them now one of the first things that you need to kill is the network manager or you should because even though it doesn't actually directly interfere with the functioning it does spawn some other processes uh, that might interfere like the like the your active internet connection here the DHC the DH client uh, especially if your network manager is configured to automatically connect to a certain network or to a wired network that you've plugged into your computer so let's just go ahead and kill. I'm not going to take any chances today. I'm going to go ahead and kill the network manager and then I will start killing the rest. So let's repeat the airmon-ng check. Excellent. Now I have a few more of these. Next one to kill. You do need to kill them in a certain order though because uh, they tend to spawn each other and you kill a process but you type, you do a check once, once more and you realize it's still up and running even though you've killed it as root it will be it will kill it but it will restart it as well let's we'll just go ahead and kill the DH client as well in order to prevent any interference and the rest of killing can be done in any way you like so kill let's just go ahead and kill 15 15 56 15 56 12 15 and 12 16 and 12 sorry 16. Excellent. Let's do a check one more time. Oops, some of them are still up. This is this is what I meant. It is highly annoying. So 15, 56. Let's see, will this work? Awahi demons are the only ones running. Apparently I have to kill the VPA supplicant first and then I can kill these. And it can be frustrating primarily because you can't kill them all at once. You gotta type in uh, commands time and time again. Excellent. No such process running. There we go. Uh, let me just go ahead and clear the screen and always perform an extra check. You see nothing has popped. Nothing should present any problems now. Let me just go ahead and clear the screen. The next thing that we want to do is perform a scan 
of our environment here to see what sort of connection what sort of networks do we have and who is connected to which network now this you cannot see with network manager with network manager you can only see uh, active wireless uh, visible wireless hotspot visible wireless access points around you while on the other hand with aircrack with air uh, with one of the tools that comes with aircrack you can actually see not only access points wireless access points around you but you can also see who is connected to them which is a very nice feature so let's just go ahead and type in the first command from my selected list here it's aero dump dash ng vlp 2 s 0 vlp 2 s 0 is our interface so airmon dash ng oops dash ng uh, vlp 2 s 0 present oh yeah not airmon sorry Aero dump, aero dump dash ng vlp 2 s 0 There for a bit of inconvenience with my talking and writing. Never was good at that. But you can see here, these are all the access, wireless access points. This one is mine. It's called something. That is that is the uh, I've created this specifically for this purpose for this tutorial. It has a good pa it has a good password, strong password and we are going to be cracking it today keep in mind that the signal strength uh, you see okay let me just cancel the scanning process now and I just want to explain a few things that you can see here during the scanning process itself so the BSSID is the MAC address of the device which is a wireless access point Oops, let's just move this out of the way excellent so the BSSID is the MAC address of that router of that wireless access point the PWR is the strength of the signal so the smaller this minus is so let's say minus 30 uh, minus 15 is a lot better than minus 30 let's put it so minus 57 you're gonna have uh, it's not gonna be the best of connections minus 78 or minus 84 uh, yeah you might be able to connect to them but this is not gonna be a good connection at all however even though the signals are this weak if you have a good enough wireless card you will be able to perform the authentication and therefore I will be able to render any of these networks that you see here pretty much inoperable but that we will do in the later tutorials for the time being I just want to show you one of the ways in which you can actually crack the VPA to encryption uh, the DOS attacks are very useful. I mean, they can practically render almost any Wi-Fi network out there useless. Nobody will be able to connect to it, or you can deauthenticate a specific client on the network, which is also extremely useful. So let's just go ahead and clear the screen. Once again, I will run the Aero dump, and I will expand this terminal so we can see some other things as well so it says something it's 90 f6 I am looking for something to be associated with 90 f6 and that is what I shall use in order to actually uh, deauthenticate because we are looking for a four-way handshake it will appear in the top right corner there we will be able to see all the packets that are coming in and there we will be able to actually capture a file and see what is going on but that is uh, that is not possible to do at the time being primarily because we are scanning for pretty much every single network out there and I just wanted to show you how it looks like the next thing that we need to do is perform a specific scan so now we will be targeting this network here as it has a good signal and more importantly than that I have a permission to do whatever I want with this network as it is mine these down below are not mine also keep in mind that we are not doing anything illegal here or anything of a kind everything that you see here is pretty much public information because this is what all the Wi-Fi uh, routers around me are broadcasting they are broadcasting their MAC address and they are broadcasting the name basically the ESSID name is not a technical term ESSID is the term but everybody I don't know refers to it as a name of a wireless access point or something of a kind anyway as I said all these are public information this is all that Wi-Fi spots around me are broadcasting and this sort of information you can also see 
on your cell phone by just using the network manager or you can use a network manager on your computer and you will see pretty much the same things you will see that it's VPA2 encryption you will see the MAC address and you will see the ESS ID of course this is the the ESS ID will be the first thing that you see on the network also you will see the channels as well uh, these stuff in between don't you don't have to worry about those they're not that relevant for our purpose today anyway I will call the tutorial here and in the next one we will be performing a specific scan where we will capture information and use that capture file in order to crack the encryption Till then, I bid you farewell and I hope to see you in the next tutorial. Hello everybody and welcome to this tutorial. Today I will be talking about DOS attacks and how you can actually deny wireless access to pretty much anybody within the range of your wireless card. Now, your current range of your wireless card is not your permanent range or probably it's not your maximum range because you can boost the signal as well but of that I shall speak a bit later on for the time being I wish to focus only on the actual DOS attack as that can well not only can you deny the service but as I stated in the previous tutorial you can, you are actually able to trick a user into resetting the router primarily because if you can't connect your wireless what is one of the first things that you do you basically just reset the router even if you call the ISP provider one of the first things that they will tell you is reset the router and these sort of attacks they don't unless they are going over an extended period of time or something like that they don't raise a lot of suspicion I mean most people when they can't connect to wireless in their houses or something like that oh well reset the router if it works out great if it doesn't oh well call the ISP then they try to fix it but you're not gonna be running the DOS attack probably for that long your idea is to force a reset however you can run actually permanent DOS attacks and in such a way deny service to a certain user or a company or something of a kind. There is no known way to actually stop this. Uh, you, there are, as I've stated in the previous tutorials as well, you can use some paint or that doesn't that doesn't allow signals to pass through, or you can use some tin foil or something like that on the walls. But you are effectively uh, limiting what you can do with your own wireless in such a way and that's not really the best of solutions anyway uh, there are certain things that a user can do on the other side to mediate the sort of an attack such as change the channel of your of their wireless access point change the MAC address but none of those things are actually stopping the DOS attacks all of those things they are sim all that they are doing is simply hiding and buying for time all you need to do is simply follow up uh, on the changes for example uh, do a scan again if you see that there is something wrong and that's it you will find a new MAC address you will find a new channel and you will see the ES the new ESS ID as well so anyway without further ado let's just go ahead and perform this sort of attack see what happens and how can we actually confirm it anyway the first thing that we need to do is uh, set our wireless network card into monitor mode. I have a small script that I have written for myself here. I have explained it in the previous tutorials. If you're just wondering why am I not doing this uh, via airmon-ng, so airmon-ng, and you can also do it like this, VLP2S0. Well, uh, I've discovered that on Fedora, the distribution that I'm using at the moment, and the one that I'm using for the demonstration of this tutorial, well, it just presents problems. I mean, uh, it creates virtual interfaces and, I don't know, you get an error like name not unique on the network and there's a way to fix that or work around something like that. But I've just written my own script and that I'm going to use. You can use it as well. I've shown it in the previous tutorial. All it does is bring the interface, wireless interface down, changes its state, uh, changes the changes the state changes the mode to monitor mode and then changes the state back to up again here we can just see it one more time quickly excellent perhaps I should have add a Mac change here as well that would be uh, that would be actually a good idea but for the time being I'm not gonna do that primarily because there is no need to hide as I am doing this to my own wireless system however if you're doing this outside definitely use Mac 
changer dash r vlp to a zero you can only apply you can only change the mac address when the interface is down you cannot change the mac address of the interface that is up how to do this i have shown in the previous tutorials as well anyway let's just go ahead and clear the screen i usually run this command airmon that airmon dash ng check vlp to a zero I use this uh, not to initiate the monitor, not to set the monitor mode, but rather instead to perform a checkup to see if there are any programs, any processes out there within my computer that might cause problems or interference. Apparently there are none. If there were, once you run this command, it would give you the PIDs of the processes and uh, you could kill them easily. No problems there. Uh, let's just go ahead and clear the screen and the tool that we need to use as part of the aircraft package here is AI replay so before we actually start doing that we will of course need to perform a scan with a tool that we have used previously so air dump I have no idea why they call it so air dump dash ng uh, VLP to a zero press enter oops arrow dump it's arrow dump, sorry. I always make a mistake there, but you can just use tab as I've shown and it's gonna work out well for you. So apparently I have some open access points here as well. And I have noticed a very strange thing. When I do, when I perform these scans during different times of day, uh, the signal strength varies and the amount of wireless access point also changes. I'm just gonna stop this because there are too many of them now. Uh, the wireless access point, the amount of wireless access point changes and the signal strength changes. What I've noticed that people are doing is that they actually turn their Wi-Fi's off during certain times of the day when they are not there or when they are not using it or something of a kind. And that is a very wise precaution. I mean, that is very, that's a very intelligent thing to do because uh, if there is nobody in your house, if there is nobody using the Wi-Fi, there is literally no reason for you to leave it online. Just pull the plug. Simple as that. Uh, you increase the safety of your wireless, of your home network exponentially. Primarily because not only are you invisible, permanently invisible during certain periods of time, but you are also uh, effectively limiting windows of opportunity for anybody to attack you. And that can cause a ridiculous amount of problems to an attacker. Anyway, so over here I have my wireless interface, it's called something. Uh, it's on channel 6 and its power its relatively good but look at my neighbors. I did this, I conducted this scan last night and my own wireless was about 50 something and my neighbors was 59 which was ridiculous. I, I'm guessing this guy is right next to me or right below me with a uh, with an antenna attached to the ceiling or something of a kind. I have no idea, but he's getting like, a really strong wireless signal. I'm gonna have to ask him around to see who this is just to see what the just to see what the signal strength is on this router. But anyway, it doesn't really matter. Let's just use uh, let's just use the AI replay. However, in, you can't, I didn't find a way to actually specify a channel in AI replay. I'm, Perhaps there is an option there or something of a kind, but it doesn't it doesn't really matter. I didn't try too hard. What I want to show you is that you can actually change the channel of your wireless inter network card manually. So just type in IV. Wait, before we actually do that, let's just try a random scan and see what happens. So AI replay dash NG. And here we're gonna need to specify dash zero. So dash zero is one of the lists is from the list of arguments that I do believe that I've showed previously but doesn't really matter. So you see in the help menu you have de-authentication, you can use dash zero instead of that, fake authentication, you can use dash one instead of that, and so on and so forth. You don't actually need to type in the whole command, rather instead you can, they've enumerated them, so it's a lot easier to actually use. Anyway, we're gonna say dash zero and space, it says count, so how many de-authentication uh, the authentication request you want to send, you can specify a number, it can be a very large number here, or you can just say one for a single de authentication for capturing the uh, WPA2 handshakes. Well, you're probably going to need more than one, but doesn't really matter. I usually have a tendency to place a zero here, zero tells it simply do it continuously. 
So you can just do it until you feel satisfied or until you've achieved your purpose and then control C to actually cancel it. No big deal there. Anyway, after that, we need to specify a dash A option, which is the BSID. And then in addition to that, we need to specify the interface that we're going to be using. Press enter and there we go. So it says here on channel three, but I know for a fact and you can scroll up, you can see here something, it says channel channel six. So this is not gonna work. It says no such BSSID available. Please specify ESSID, so the name, perhaps the name of the network. Yeah, that is due to this channel problem. So this is channel three and my wireless interface card is functioning on, my, my app wireless access point is actually functioning on channel six while my wireless network card is functioning on channel three in my laptop. What we need to do is manually configure the channel of our network card. So IV, IW, sorry, config VLP2S0, which is the name of our interface and then channel and then just say six. So it's very simple. It's like English language. You have you have a command. So iwconfig, the name of your wireless interface. Just type in the argument that you want to change, which is channel. Same thing with mod, with mode. So just type in mod here and change it to whatever you want. But in this case, we're changing the channel. So just type in channel space and then just type in the number of the channel you wish to tune it. You wish to change it to anyway. Now our wireless network card is running is operating on channel 6 and if we repeat the command that I have previously shown you will see immediately immediately it actually passes this attack is more effective when targeting a connected world yep okay so there is a there is a there is this message that we're being displayed here this is not an error message this is just a note of a sort we can also deauthenticate individual clients on the network so we don't need to you see this attack that I'm performing now this will deauthenticate everyone on that wireless card, on that wireless access point. Everybody will be deauthenticated. I mean, you can confirm this by uh, using your smartphone or tablet or another PC that is connected to the wireless ne to your home wireless network, and it might show the status that it is still connected. But try browsing the net. Try opening up a website or something of a kind. You will not be able to do it. Like not in a million years. Also, there are some Mac filtering options that routers tend to impose, but doesn't matter. I've shown you how you can change a Mac address, and you can also set a script which will rotate your Mac addresses periodically, so that, that can be a nightmare. Uh, also, the routers have the option to like adjust the Mac address to adjust a certain range of MAC addresses which can access it, but again, you will be able to see the authenticated clients on that network and just use their MAC addresses instead and pass through. As I said, this is ridiculously difficult to stop, and it's it's a, it's really painful when you're being DOSed in terms of wireless. Uh, there's very little that you can do. Uh, I honestly don't know of any known method to actually completely stop this, but we'll see there are some there are some enterprise type routers that are actually able to fight this off to an extent but we'll see what the future brings anyway i will be doing more of this in the follow up tutorial and i will show you how you can deauthenticate a single client plus we'll be writing down some bash scripts and see how that works out to improve our attack in any case i bid you farewell and i hope to see you in the next tutorial